Christine. Uh, is here. And I'm also here. But. <laughs> and we're so happy to see you. I, I, th- I, th- I thank you. I'm um, delighted. I'm delighted to be in your presence, quite frankly. I wonder how. Thank you. That's very sweet of you. And not at all feels forced like I have a gun no, against your even, But Not even um, a little bit. <laughs> I wonder how many episodes start with me going, Christine. I'm just, like all of them, really. Uh, yeah, that's. I don't know how to. Oh. That's how I make an entrance too when I see you face to face. I don't know how that's, to see you. I, I heard you make. I heard it. that's what you do anytime you enter a room, whether I'm there or not. It's just yeah. Kind Allison's of your, always confused by it, but it's just your opening line, um, and I think <laughs> it's a good one. It's a powerful one, you know. Really well, sets the tone. Well, I I gotta. I said your name because I I meant it. I wanted to thank you. Because we never oh. opened Christmas presents with each other. Oh, I know. Uh, we I, usually do the big, like, we're, we're 10 and we make a huge deal out of it. Um, which, by the way, let's, I don't think you're shaming it, but let's continue We're not knocking that. it. We're not let's knocking it. Let's continue that. No, it, I don't want that to It was just one of those fade. years where it was too hard to navigate with starting the tour. So we had to pff, mail presents. Lame. Uh, well, one of the things that Sweet Christine sent me. I mean, you sent me many lovely things. You sent me a calendar that is very on par for us. You sent me a Bagel Bites gummies. You really you <laughs> nailed it. Well done. But my favorite thing is Christine um, sent me some federal drugs through the federal mail. Um, okay, no, 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 no. See, you haven't even f- looked. You haven't even opened it yet. Have I you? have opened it. I have oh, opened it. Okay, but you sent me. Some drugs. Your your name is on this prescription, Christine. <laughs> that How part dare was you? an accident. And you it was mailed... supposed to say you. What's your it supposed name? to say? And My name? Schultz. Yes. Well, instead it says Christine Schieffer, and it is your literal prescription right here on this <laughs> bottle. And then you mailed it to me. Can you imagine if in a stop they would have been so confused if they checked this bag? And on the inside, my friends, I don't know how you got a hold of some Xanax for me. But you got me one whole bar of Xanax that very conveniently fits on my crock. Yay! You real? By the way, what did you look up Xanax like v- drugs for my Crocs? What did you look up to purchase this? <laughs> I looked up. I looked up drugs for Crocs, and uh, no, I don't. I don't. Like, I don't how quickly? Have any... How quickly could you find a bar of Xanax Croc gidget or gibbet or whatever it's called? It instant instantaneously i mean i don't <laughs> recall the journey i went to, on to find it i just recall the success story it quickly became when i realized there is only and i remember like casually asking you because i don't take xanax or i i did like at one time in my life briefly in grad school but uh i you know as you know i'm a clonopin girly um <laughs> but I remember kind of casually asking you if you took any sort of ever anti-anxiety meds and you said something like, oh, I I was prescribed Xanax. And I was like, check, 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 because they had other options, right? They had a clonopin Mm. one. They had other ones. And I was like, well, I need to get the one that most suits you. Um, But I didn't know that it came with like a little cute like label on a prescription bottle or I would have specified like, don't put my fucking name on it. (laughs) Like, I think it doesn't have your address on it too. No, it doesn't have your address. Oh my god! But if it did, that would be wild. They would be. This might be actually a drug front that I'm somehow uh, <laughs> paying for, and I didn't realize it. No, it just says um, your yeah, name. It, it, but it appeared also much say, more realistic than I thought. It, it appeared much more realistic. It than looks I thought. real. Like it looks like, like all the information is there, and it even has an expiration date, which, by the way, is a 2000 year 2000 so it's oh, heavily <laughs> it's really powdery xanax that doesn't work anymore <laughs> um and then i do like on the back it does say fake prescription so somewhere if you oh, look hard oh, enough oh, it I lets you know that. because they sent it in just a little envelope and i remember when i first got it because it was like during the midst of all the christmas shopping and i i got this little thing and it was from I bought it from Etsy, so it had just some random person's return address, and I was like, what is this? And I open it, and there's a pill bottle inside, and I'm like, what the hell did I order <laughs> in my, like, 
you know, Delta nine drug haze one night or my wine, wine, <laughs> wine ordering. I don't know what I did, but I was like, holy shit. And um, then I opened it and was like, this is rubber. Okay. Well, it's for last thing I'll say is the fake prescription directions on it would kill a grown man. Cause it says take one tablet up to three times a day. And it's like eight times the amount that I take for one dosage. Like it's so how it's much is the like, dosage on that? I don't think I got to select that. I part. take 0.25 and it says a full 2.0. So it's two, literally eight times, times the day. amount. Oh, that's not bad. I mean, it's not as much. I mean, I take, take less. Take than it that. three times a day. So that's technically 24 times the amount of Xanax that I usually take. <laughs> so I know. Yeah, it would, would kill maybe would not a grown that. man, but it would kill you. <laughs> so so maybe don't follow that that label. Um Anyway, um, I'm so glad that you got it. I, I sent I sent a little boxy box. Um, yes, and I did select no perfumes or drugs or whatever the hell, gasoline or whatever they ask at the post office. Thank um, you. Yeah. With a little tee hee. Uh-huh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just wanted to publicly um, make sure oh, you got the well, credit I'm... for your lovely Christmas gift. Cause it, I'm so it's... glad that you figured out it was a jib. At first, I thought you really thought I was sending you my, my drugs. And I was like, listen, I'd do that for you if you really wanted me to. But that it wasn't. I appreciate uh, I didn't that. just do it without ask without being asked. Um, that would be a little presumptuous. But uh, <laughs> I wouldn't have, anyway. I, I wouldn't have questioned it at all. I would have been like, I know That's you a would. I right know there. you would have yeah. been like, great. Just what I was thinking. Um, <laughs> anyway, um, how are you, Em? I miss anyway, you. Anyway, I'm good. I miss you. I saw you because we had our very first shows. Oh uh, yeah, they all went great. No passing out here. Um, uh, Christine even complimented my behavior backstage, which made me feel very good. I'm going to talk to my therapist about I it tonight. I gave you a gold star for your behavior. It makes it sound like I'm some fucking elementary school teacher. No, I appreciated the feedback. Um, no, it and- was okay. To be clear, I wasn't a com- I wasn't like, you know, critiquing M backstage. I was just saying, "Wow, M, I don't. I hope this is helpful. Not, I don't. I mean this in a, the most positive way, but you are like." kicking butt back like you're being so you know in the past I feel like there was such (laughs) deep-seated fear and terror about passing out or about having a heart issue or about getting on stage at all and I feel like you've really um evolved I don't know you've just you seem like a wholly different person now after your surgery sweet well everyone thanks Jordan um my therapist Mm. um oh I do uh... daily in my in my daily (laughs) prayers I only say one (laughs) prayer and it's just Jordan me too actually <laughs> uh but she uh we're trying a new tactic for dealing with my stage fright which is i hadn't heard about it before but it's like uh, it's called i it's either i n s or i f s i forget i forget what it means but i tried the emdr stuff e edmr one of them is music and one of them's therapy EDM. Um, <laughs> i tried i tried edm i played a lot of uh dubstep backstage and uh-huh. It didn't which, seem by the to way, help M's heart condition at all, which was so weird. The irony, because dubstep was like, I was a dubstep kid I in know college. You. I cannot. And now my heart can't take it. All. Well, so I was trying. You would I did, love I, a glow stick. You're such a sucker for a fucking glow stick. Homie, I literally would go to the Day Glow Festival where they I would know, just shoot I neon know. paint out. Oh, my God. It's like, anyway. it's like the thing that I know the most about you, even though you've never told me, you know? I love it. Well, yeah. so I'm trying this new therapy with uh with. So you Jordan. tried EMDR. Didn't work? Didn't work at I've all, heard which wonderful was so disappointing because everyone I know like that has tried it's it swears thing, by it. It's the thing I'm going to try next <laughs> okay well if it doesn't work for you just know that you're not alone because it was not Thank it you. was not my vibe um okay okay and now i'm trying this new thing and i did feel i don't want to say it like too out loud because i don't want to like totally like jinx myself but it i if i could feel a difference when i was backstage so i'm so glad i'm um... hope I, thank you so um and yeah i didn't i the passing out thing didn't happen. I'm very excited. Anyway, and on top of that, our three audiences were all very lovely. We did a great oh, job. Oh, it so. was it was one of those stretches where like I just felt so wholesome after every show. It felt like every show was fun and happy. Not that we ever feel like shitty after a show, but sometimes you feel kind of like, oh, maybe I dropped the ball or maybe they the vibe wasn't right. But I feel like they all just were were fun and great. There's one city. <laughs> I'm trying to think. I'm like, which one? All well, those you know the like, one. Couldn't be us. You know, you know the that one. I, you know I'm so good at compartmentalizing. I remember absolutely nothing from this. I'm not gonna say leg, it right? here, but we did say we may not return. 
What? Well, guys, I don't remember. So um, clearly, I had a great time at all the three. So uh, uh, at these th- at these three, yes. I'm saying in the past, there's been a city. Oh, that oh we... no, I'm sorry. I meant this oh, segment no. of three. I was like, M, you are really scaring Baltimore, DC, and Philly, and Philly. right now. No, no, no. 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 We what like I'm all saying those. is these three against all odds, all of them were great. Usually, yes. like in a leg, one of them might be off or or things. I, we've had experiences. Um, <laughs> That's what I'm talking about. But none of that has happened yet, knock on wood. So uh, I feel like we got, we kicked off to a great start is what I'm saying. But yeah, um, I'm excited for the other ones. We shall never return to. And I wonder if anybody could guess it. Ha 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 ha. Probably not. I think anyone who was at that show, (laughs) I don't know. I was. No, I I don't think so. Because one of my friends was at that show and she was like, wait, what happened? Uh, So yeah, wild, wild. Yeah. Not for us. We have secrets that we'll probably just (laughs) say next week, forgetting that it was a secret. Um, anyway, (laughs) anyway, sorry, everyone. I just needed to throw an inside joke out that nobody gets to be a part of. I don't know why I did that. That was so mean. Um, what's that about? I don't know. I'm really feeling interesting today. Uh, Christine. (gasps) Okay. (laughs) Yeah. Go on. Go on. It must be all the Xanax you sent through the mail. That's actually meant for my shoe. And I just ingested plastic. It's like you opened it. And since it's 23 years old, all the powder just kind of went up in the air (laughs) and and infiltrated (laughs) Why do you drink, Christine? Oh, okay. Well, so here's the thing. I was supposed to have a really big reason today that I was going to, like, knock your socks off um, with. What? I was supposed to on Saturday, which, again, not again. I have never said this. But to clarify, I was Mm -hmm. going to tell you this on Friday when we were supposed to record. And Mm -hmm. then you and I ended up having, like, a really long meeting and didn't get to record we bailed on recording doesn't sound like us at all i know shocker um (laughs) (laughs) but today so i was gonna announce this then and it was supposed to happen saturday Mm -hmm. but then when we didn't record i was like shit okay i'll have to tell you retroactively but then Mm -hmm. it never happened i was supposed to go to bobby mackey's on saturday (gasps) you bitch what What happened i know i know so i was supposed to tell you this on friday and i was gonna be like um i have a confession I was invited to a double date on a double date with a new friend. <gasps> and she was like, oh, have you been to Bobby Mackey's down in Wilder? And I was like, no. Oh, my God. It's and probably like, for the best that you would have gone a, without me first and just experienced it as a bar. Scared. And she goes, oh, I go all the time. Like, it's great. I love it there. And I was like, wait, really? And she's like, yeah, I mean, it's really kind of hokey. But then she says to me. What? And so at first I'm thinking like, uh, I don't know. But then she says to me. Oh, but they're renovating within the next couple of months and they're like completely like changing and gutting the whole place. So she's like, so you should go. definitely. I know. So she was like, you definitely have to see it before they do that. And I was like, fuck. OK, so I was like, no, not that. I'd right. say we have to go after when they've pissed everything off. Then well, yeah, that around, too. But know? I want to see like the original like bar, like because it's been sure. the same apparently forever. And now they're going to try and modernize it and all this. But I want to see it as like a honky tonk bar, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, lo- like, I love a dive. Glory. Right. Like, I want to see it as the divey heyday bar. So I said, okay, okay. So I told Blaze, well, I I told him we had a double date. I failed to tell him where we were going for a while. And then I told him a few days later and he goes, I just kind of like said it really casually. And he was like, wait, where are we going? And I was like, oh, Bobby Mackey's, it's this bar. Like thinking somehow he would not know what it is. And he goes, um, isn't that place really haunted? And I went, yeah, but since you don't really believe in he goes, I don't want to go there. And oh. I was like, wait a minute. So I was like, wait, you don't want to go there? And he's like, no, can we go somewhere else? And I was like, oh, now my God. this is interesting. <laughs> I, so there's something I about know. your house that has freaked him out officially because I know, I know. It's definitely it's that third floor because I, uh, it's true. I, I think it's true. It's, you know what he that's that's you and his version of like whether or not you like salami because <laughs> every now and then you're like I love it and then I have to log it in my head as like oh you like salami and then the next day I'll go what are you talking about I literally don't eat salami I would never eat that <laughs> yeah. so I, I, I'm constantly in a whiplash with you about your interests and now he's finally you're getting your I'm getting the whiplash your return. Dues. Yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. I sure, sure am. And so I said, Blaze, and I, 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 he's one of those people that like, if I really am like, I would like to do this or I, he will relent, right? But I'm also the kind of person who will not force someone into something. So I was like, Blaze, I really want to go. I don't want to tell my friend like two days before 
that we my, can't My go. husband's so scaredy cat. Yeah. My husband's too scared. But okay. He also framed it then like as, because he's going to listen to this and be like so mad at me. Um, but he also framed it as more of a, so it's, it's down south of me in Kentucky. And he framed it as like, isn't that where all the Trumpers go? Which okay. it is. And okay. it's still a smoking bar. Like people still smoke in there. And he's like, I don't know. That doesn't sound like my vibe. He did start off with, isn't that place really haunted? So uh-huh. that and was then he the tried first. To recover. Tried to recover. Then he tried to recover. That's right. And he was and like, so... what are things that Christine doesn't want to touch with a 10 foot Exactly. Pole? <laughs> and then I was like, well, I can't argue against that. Okay. This isn't salami. Trumpers are not my salami. You know what I mean? Like I'm always an anti-Trump, anti-Trumper. <laughs> I'm, I'm mostly an anti-salami, sometimes not. Uh-huh, and so uh-huh. I said, okay, I'll see what I can do. And I kind of awkwardly texted my friend and was like, oh, man, like, Blaze is being really weird about it. I'm so surprised. She's like, oh, well, I mean, we can change it. And Blaze was like, don't change it. Let's just go. So for two days, I felt really on edge about it. And then when we met on Friday, I was like, okay, I have to, like, tell M when we record. But then the next morning, I woke up to a text from my friend being like, shit my fiance's sick um so like we have to cancel i'm so sorry i'm just saying the cosmos really made sure that cosmos does not want me there we have i feel like yeah like we haven't really talked about it but like i've tried to go down folks like when em and you were in town like we've tried to go and something always comes up or something always stops us from going to the point that now i've got it in my head that i'm not supposed to be there so when started reacted, having like that we thought like, about like going there one time and christine yeah. started having nightmares about the place like hurting us yeah. I felt and it was so embarrassing like I had to tell Eva and Em like I know it was my idea to go and like do a ghost hunt there when you guys visit because it's so close to me and it's so much easier than like traveling somewhere and then like two weeks before I was like you guys I have to admit something I'm really scared like too scared like I started having nightmares about falling into the pit in the basement and it was just horrible. Anyway. Yeah. Um, so anyway, we ended up so going somewhere else. <laughs> I never. So I'm still, still not there. But I'm f- afraid about them renovating because I want to see it before and after. Um, so you better come on back and <laughs> yeah, we can do we can do a redo. Uh, maybe. I don't know. Maybe the universe will literally put. We'll just go in the middle up. of the day. If anyone's going to be scared of the Trumpers in midday, it'll be me. Don't worry. You'll have nothing to worry about. You'll have to. Oh, excellent. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'll be fine. Uh, I'll just we... be la di da. Yeah. 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 Lose your social security card there. <laughs> You'll have a good time. <laughs> um, um, but they do ghost tours like while you're there, which I didn't realize. My friend was like, oh, yeah, they take you like downstairs. And then I started getting really freaked out. So uh, <laughs> that's the story of how I almost and then didn't go to Bobby Mackey's. So, <laughs> and that's why you drink. And that's why I drink. Yes, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. alone without any Trumpers, just in my house. It sounds um, like you ended up having a good time. Then hey, I'm fine I, with that. I mean, I did. I I, I just stayed home and drank wine. Worst case myself. scenario is you didn't have to hang out with people who are against history. So right, um, like I'm not <laughs> who don't believe in science. So I, I you know, <laughs> I I felt like all right, fine. It's not the worst outcome. Um you know, aside from my friend being sick. But anyway, um, why do you drink this week? I I drink in a stressed way because I have a lot to clean. The 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 troll hole is at a threat level midnight currently. Oh no. I have to like wig I've created a path to be able to walk to this laptop. Um but it's oh, bad yeah. everywhere else. Uh, you cannot see the floor. It has and I'm leaving in two days for us to go back on our next leg. So oh, right. Um, and I'm leaving early, which I, I chose for myself, but I've never gone to Salt Lake and I'm trying to... You've never been to Salt Lake? I mean, I've like passed through like We've in an been airport. on tour. I know, but that was when we got really, really uh, altitude sick. And so I never got to appreciate the town. Oh, okay. I was like, I swear I've been there unless I'm having like a... <laughs> no, I'm going, I'm going early this time because I want to like get... Like acclimated the and town. then have fun versus like yeah. just feeling like I want to vomit and can't wait to leave. Um, well, I, I mean, honestly, I'm, uh, that alone has been a huge improvement. Like uh, last year, you were not even thinking about going anywhere before. The I know. Show, so, yeah, I know. And I'm I, uh, thank you. I, and I'm trying to. Um, I'm very lucky to be in a position where I don't have a lot of responsibilities back home. Like I, I feel bad that you have to dash off. I know you're happy to dash off cause you've have loved ones to go home to, but while I don't have that, um, 
I am like, if I'm going to a city I'm probably never going to go to again, I really need to like fucking commit to the bit. I and, totally like, get it. I'm, and enjoy can, the city. So it's such a healthy way to travel. I'm like, I want to stay inside in my hotel room and DoorDash food because I'm No, that lazy. sounds lovely too. That sounds like its own <laughs> vacation. But I also know if I go back again and don't appreciate it, then I'll be like, oh man, like when am I ever going to fly back there except for another I got show? You. So I'm, I'm well, excited. It's very respectable. I think um, I will just live vicariously through you and figure out what Salt Lake is like. I'll text you, you pictures of it. the yeah. things you missed. <laughs> <laughs> wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> um, so anyway, I'm I'm looking forward to that. I think the thing that I drink, the reason why I drink, and it's um, also in retrospect, is that uh, it's finally happening, folks. I'm getting Leona on my side. Oh, yes, you did. Okay. I told true. you it happened eventually. And I was, I been, waited. Okay, I, I played the long it, game. It wasn't even a long game. You've only met her like three times and on the third time she was old enough to like have fun with you third time's a charm the other time she just stared at you third time's a charm anyway it it was indeed and she really uh she taught em all about wobbly mountain um mm-hmm. and the f- the first thing that she actually said to you aloud was she tumbled off wobbly mountain which is part of the game and she landed and she just out of nowhere goes sorry funkle em and we all were like what I was like, first of all, you know my name, and second of all, what are we apologizing about? (laughs) We were all kind of frozen, and she just kept apologizing for falling off Wobbly Mountain. I don't, I don't know, but we just we took it as a win. Yeah, and uh, my personal favorite. At one point, we we were all eating pizza, and she looked at me. She went, "Uncle M, I'm so happy we both eat pizza." Oh yeah, (laughs) and I went, (laughs) and I went, me too. That's (laughs) you were like Christine. Did you see that? I was like, yep, I saw that. I and uh. I was not at all trying to like freak her out and like approach her at all. I, you know, I would also be doing the same thing if I had a kid where you're trying to teach her like boundaries and she doesn't have to do anything she doesn't want to do. So yeah, I was not expecting any physical interaction with this child. And three different times I got organic hugs. And I, think, I, went, I think that's why I think it is because we didn't say like, you have to go, you know, I, I, right, right, I'm right. still struggling with that a little bit with my, with certain like older pe- people in my family where I'm like, not, not like immediate family, but you know, where I'm like, you know, she doesn't, we're teaching her, she doesn't have to hug you if she doesn't feel comfortable, you know, or things like that, which have been kind of an uphill battle for the I feel like our generation part, and younger all totally get it. Like we're yes, just like, exactly. I think there were just a few people who didn't quite catch on right away. Um, but well, yeah, yeah, because we all grew up with like, oh, go give them a hug, go say hi. Kiss. It's like, yeah, go want to give that creepy fucking face. person a hug. And you're like, who is that lady? <laughs> yeah. Um, so. No, so I'm very excited that um, she knows I like pizza. Uh, she Which is like, what about... more does she need to know? Really? I mean, because well, at one point I went. Are you, are you happy that you're eating pizza? She went, I'm so happy. And then she went, Funkle, <laughs> Funkle M, I'm so happy we both like pizza. And I went, oh, <laughs> now I'm in, I'm in, that's the green light. That's all I needed. To now get. you're in the fold. <laughs> and um, uh, what was I going to say about her? Oh, she, we've started something over here at Schultz Fourth Manor, which is me and Allison's apartment, by the way. Yeah, sure. Um, at Schultz Fourth Manor, we now have a, a, it's customary. We've picked it up from queen leona queen of wobbly mountain oh sure um that when you leave a, a room you go <laughs> you go chow chow <laughs> and so which by um, the way was also new to me i want to add to everybody that that was new to me when it happened in front of em i was like listen you and me both I- i'm i'm shook also every time she leaves a room with with uh christine's mom she go chow chow mom chow chow Ch- chow chow and i just sat there like <laughs> Em, I'm just as stunned as you are. Otherwise, I would. And she'll say, uh, "I guess she uh, she's overheard for you know her her whole lifetime at this point (laughs) that Christine and Blaze before they leave they'll say like, oh, you look good, bye or something.' Because now when she leaves a room, I don't know what started it, but I witnessed it. Yeah, is that as she was leaving, she would just say out loud over and over again, "I look good, I look good," until someone would agree. And yeah, until someone said, "You look good," and she'd go, (sighs) "Yeah." Chow okay. chow mom. Oh, yeah. <laughs> chow chow. Yeah. It it really is the wildest thing. Like I look good. And it's funny because she says it in just such a very calm, like matter of fact way. It's not really like, oh, I look so good, like in this like sassy no, way. It's, it's just, just like, like a factual I a look factual, good. I look good. And like she usually does because she is wearing, you know, a big pink puffy jacket and like a lion hat. So I'm like, you do look good. But she needs someone to and my mom was like, You look great. And she's like, I look good. 
And I'm like, mom, you have to say she looks good. You look good. Ciao, ciao. I mean, it's just the weirdest <laughs> thing. But I'm so glad that it stuck with you because uh, ciao, ciao really became a hit. Um, it did. It's it's now become um, multi-coastal now over here. We, wow. We, we're trying out ciao, ciao quite a lot over here. So <laughs> ciao, ciao's making waves, you know. Kiss, kiss. Yeah, yeah. Kiss, kiss. um okay anyway that's why i drink because leona and i the the alliance is forming before our very eyes i love it i love to see it yeah okay beautiful and with that that's why we drink i don't know why everyone else drinks but this is your reminder to drink some water you thirsty little rats yeah my basic bitch stanley that i bought before i realized how basic bitchy it was but i love it it has a a big foot sticker from lisa lampanelli on it i love it i feel like you uh just missed the visco era and now you're really leaning into the stanley era remember when your sister kept saying you were like a wannabe visco girl but it had already kind of passed fucking rude by the way i was like what the hell is that Um, but they were like into their hydro flasks and now you've got your stanley i I know and I, i I kind of also had a hydro flask, so I'm like, man, I think I just follow the water trend, which is that's fine, embarrassing, but you know, I, your doctor would be proud. That's a that's a trend you should say, follow. It's a trend that actually makes my life a little better, so I might as well lean into it. You know. Well, Christine, tell me. Speaking of water, I've got my LD, my liquid death, <laughs> and I say we crack into it. I love the theatrics of it all, you know. I mean, um, you do, and I do, and we all do. So, okay, I have, I tried to throw a fun little spin on this um, because we were, like you said, we were going to record on Friday. It's still only a few days away from that, so we're still within the week, and I'm going to lean into it. Um, we were going to record on Friday, which happened to be the seventh Saint anniversary. Oh, wait, no. What? <laughs> The seventh anniversary. I said, I said Saint Nicholas Day, which is December sixth. Never mind. I don't know what uh, <laughs> planet I'm living on. Whatever calendar you're working off of, you have a good time. But I'm over here I don't on know Earth. Where I, and yeah. um, sorry, my my mistake. I'll come back. <laughs> well, the, this was the seventh anniversary of me asking you, proposing, if you will, um, yeah, to start a podcast with me and to take this crazy adventure that we call life. And so... Oh, my God. Um, hold hands together. Oh, it's beautiful. <laughs> uh, and so as the seventh anniversary of you and me <gasps> building something our... greater than we could ever imagine... We uh, have our... Uh, on the calendar, it's listed as Podcast Conception Day, which is an interesting choice of words that we committed to seven years ago. T- or six, yeah. it's, six It was the day ago. you and I conceived something, a, a, a miracle. Yeah? A miracle anyway. of twinkle in our eye was finally brought to life. That's the truth. And um, to be on brand, I thought that we should cover uh, the seven gates of hell. Oh, <gasps> what? And by that... I mean, this is a bit of a great value, Seven Gates of Hell. Um, and we're a bit of Good, a great value we, brand in general. Like it, yeah, I was going to say, I think if it were anything more, nobody would know what to do. So so this is the Seven Gates of Hell of Collinsville, Illinois. <laughs> <laughs> what? Wait a minute. What's happening now? Now I'm in. And also, we're going to do a little drop off at Acid Bridge, which happens to be nearby the Gates of Hell. So let's talk about oh. both of them. <laughs> okay. Are you on board? Great. I just said, uh, um, yeah, cur- yeah. I mean, I want to say willingly, but I'm not even sure if that's true. I'm just, I'm here for the ride. None of this has been willing. It's seven years of just dragging each other one direction. I mean, you're right. Other, like, so. I didn't even barely agree to doing the podcast to, to start with. But again, yeah, this I'm is also the seventh anniversary of you saying no and rejecting me. Which so. is, we always kind of brush over that part. But just to be clear, I did say no, everybody, and um, M, thank God, was uh, insistent. And Blaze told me I needed a hobby. So here we are. Um, thank God. Thank God. Blaze was on to something. So maybe it's for the best mm-hmm. you didn't go to Bobby Mackey's without I know. me and that's cheat on me. That's why when he says shit like that, I'm cheating on you. <laughs> that's, why, that's why when he says shit like that, I'm like, oh, fuck, maybe he knows something, you know? Yeah, maybe he's he's got one of those like weird guts where he doesn't want to believe in anything. Like he's a skeptic, but he listens to his tummy, you know? And that doesn't, that makes me nervous. Yeah, yeah. Collinsville, Illinois. It's no Galena. No. I'm so in love with her. So Galena, if you're love listening, her. it's not We got you. a message from Galena. I get quite a few messages from Galena. Everyone sees the cobblestone street and they just got to let me know about it. 
I, oh, oh no, Fun- Funko M. We what? got, I don't know if you saw this in our Slack because you don't go in Slack, but I finally went in Slack and I saw that the, this is maybe a, an incentive that like the, somebody who works there, like either a tourism board or something reached out and said <gasps> like, come on down to Galena. And I said, M, we're doing this. I tagged you in it. So you better go look at it after this. Okay. Uh, Yeah. Why don't we just tell Andrew that we need to go to Galena for a show? Well, I don't think we even have to because we've already been invited, baby. Okay. Hey, okay, okay, okay. Well, maybe maybe Collinsville will be the next one. I don't know. We can perform at all seven gates of hell. What do you think? Why not? Okay. Collinsville, Illinois is about 15 miles away from St. Louis, just to give you an idea where in the world we are. Mm -hmm. At its peak which was a long time ago, the town's population was as large as the population of London. What? Today it is now 24,000 people, which is roughly Fredericksburg, Virginia. Wow. Okay. Just a fun fact. This, by the way, we're going to really get into the fun facts of this place. Can't wait. The town is in the Bible Belt, which you and I are both familiar with. It is also in the heart of the Corn Belt, which I wonder if you know what that is. Dab, dab, of course, oh, the breadbasket. Corny the corn belt. belts is not what I was talking about, Christine, but okay. Oh, oh, my bad. Yeah, now I'm the corny one. Um, And fun fact, this is a personal favorite, and we're going to do a mini deep dive for the next few bullets. This place is also the horseradish capital of the world. <gasps> I knew I had, a, I had a liking for this place. They even have an annual horseradish festival, which will be held this year on our birthday weekend. You're kidding me. Okay, well, Vic, v- v- uh, tourism board of Collins, what is it? Collinsville. Tourism board, Collinsville, please reach out. <laughs> um, in case you were interested in not doing something with me on our birthday, but going to Collinsville for the horseradish festival, Sounds you would so experience a cornhole mm-hmm. a cornhole tournament. There is a craft village. There is a Bloody Mary contest. I mean, there's a car show, a bike show, live music, a 5K run, games for everybody, and then a root ceremony, including a root toss, where I'm pretty sure they like, like shot Uh, put horse horse radish. (laughs) (laughs) Okay, everything but the car show, bike show, and uh, running, Mm -hmm. I'm in. I think the point is there's something for everyone. So someone else can do that stuff. But okay, I'm great. really, I'm very interested in this root toss because it does sound like they just throw horseradish across the field and that's their ceremony. It's like a pumpkin chuck, but with horseradish. Yes, you've got it. Loving it, um, loving it. I also wanted to throw a fun fact about horseradish out there that it is not a type of radish, which is what my brain went to because radish is in the word. So, well, sure. Um, but they are both part of the same the family. Horse family. Not <laughs> horse. <laughs> and not radish. Radish and horseradish uh, both come from the mustard family, which is also mm. called the cabbage family. So I guess mustards and cabbage are the same thing in science. Yeah, like mustard greens, you mm-hmm. know. Well, so they're cousins of the cauliflower, mm. which is interesting to me because they all kind of have that snappy, you know. Yeah, it's interesting to me that they have a family tree, but, uh, you know, I guess that's besides the point. If, I, if there was an Ancestry.com for vegetables, I'd lose my fucking mind. Um, I mean, it sounds like you're literally reading off it right now. <laughs> well, I've only gotten, like, a cousin in. I haven't gotten to, like, the the real web <laughs> of it all, so. Um, <laughs> the, the twice removed and all that good stuff. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, the other fun fact I want to give to you is horseradish is not related to radishes or horses. But the mm. reason it's called horseradish is because originally there's two versions of how this went is that horse of horseradish was originally a figurative term for strong because it has a strong taste. Oh, sure. And radish is actually Latin for the word root. So at the time it just meant a strong root. Okay. That's interesting. Also, the other version is that horseradish is a over time bastardized word for coarse radish. And so if it were coarse, uh, a coarse root, that would also make sense because in its original form, it is coarse. And very chuckable. Very chuckable. And the last thing I'm going to say, which since we're all about the science in every which way 
impossible form on and that's how you drink <laughs> fun fact horseradishes are not actually spicy or have that kind of bite to them really and until they are ground up or macerated in some way which includes being chewed so if you were to just plop it in your mouth mm. as a whole root it is not spicy at all it's only when you actually start it's like a Whoa. volatile compound as they say where once you actually start chewing into it and grinding on it then that heat feeling is like because of a release it. of cells what these cells are called isothiocyanates and shut the fuck up and when you chew on them and they are released into the into oxygen that's what creates the hotness on your when it mixes with your saliva. So it's not actually spicy oh, that's until pretty crazy until everything reacts with each other. Like so, if you lick it, you wouldn't taste spicy. That's crazy. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Wow. Fun fact. Okay. Did you know, I love love horseradish. You know, I mean, you did. I took right? a guess. Like, deep in, deep down. Yeah, yeah. I took a guess. Um, mm. because I hate. I it. ate some last night. That's great. On you my bread. I went downstairs at midnight and had a midnight snack of bread with horseradish and Swiss cheese. <laughs> mm. It was delicious. It was delicious. I bet someone else agrees with you, but it's not me. Um. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. To be honest, I'm not sure. <laughs> I do like a radish. And I, I am weird because I don't know if this is weird, but I've, I've never met anybody who's agreed with me as I shared this information with them that I like to just eat radishes like they're grapes, like just plop them in and chew them mm, i mean I, my mom but she eats a lot of weird things so i don't know that she's the best example um i love a radish yeah, they kind of have I, like they're zingy right they're a little bit zingy yeah i thought i first well, a while i thought i was allergic to them i didn't know other people felt that <laughs> it was like oh but i like it <laughs> i love that you're like so i just kept eating them like grapes just kept going <laughs> anyway that's my um that's my bit of a deep dive shallow dive on horseradish wow. um i mean listen i am thrilled Thank you. Well, hey, you, if you ever need to know where the Horse Rash Festival is, Collinsville, Illinois, which their has their own personal urban legend that their town is the entrance to hell and will be the gates of this of hell will open to anyone willing to pass through and go through the rituals of seeing each gate. Uh, oh, if my you Lord. Pass, oh, if, okay. if you want to pass through the gates... There are seven that you must pass through in a particular order to summon hell to this plane. So it's almost like hell is hidden in plain sight. And the only way to actually access it is to do these things. Whoa. Um, these gates are actually um, old railroad trestles or like the bridge overpasses over like a, a road oh. or a river. And it would have a train on the top. Um, this town used to be a mining town. So they have a lot of railroad trestles. Oh, and I love a mining town. And seven of them have become known as the individual gates to hell if you drive through them in order. Mm. What makes it extra creepy is that a lot of them have graffiti on them or like nature's reclaiming them. They just look super scary. Maybe not. I saw a picture of one just looked like kind of not that bad. But at night when like the teens are out. Oh, no, it, I'm scared already. I know. All of a sudden it's a real creepy place. The mm -hmm. best way to find these bridges is to drive down the one road that goes through all of them, which is called Lebanon Road. I hope it's Lebanon Road and not Lebanon. Or I know it, it looks like Lebanon, but then there is a type of baloney called Lebanon baloney. And, and I, mean, I didn't know there's it was... a Lebanon, Ohio called Lebanon. So, you know, but the Lebanon knows? baloney, I'm mispronouncing it right now. It's like Le 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 Lebanon or something. What? It's something. RJ's obsessed with it. And then I tried talking about it with him. He was like, that's not how it's pronounced. So anyway, we're hoping you that fool. it's Lebanon Road, folks. Okay. Okay. And ironically, to get to this road, it originally starts as Church Street. So mm -hmm. you have to take Church Street to get to the Seven Gates of Hell. Sounds right. Um, so you take this road. It will lead you out of Collinsville. And to make the ritual work, there are specific rules, which I guess, depending on what group of teenagers you talk to, there's different versions for what the right rules are. Mm -hmm. But like some will say, you have to go through the final gate at midnight. Some say you have to go through the first gate at midnight. You know. Um, 
but it's important to stop at each gate and really take in the night, which I appreciate because it's giving the ritual intent and you're not just speeding through them to say like, oh, I drove through all seven and now I'm in hell. Ha ha ha. Yeah. Right. right, right. Ha 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 ha. Uh, you stop at each one. You like try to just enjoy the silence, see what you're experiencing, take it all in. Um, and that's kind of it. You just drive from each location, which actually sounds like a lovely date idea if we're doing this during the day. Is like let's just I'm go. Down, to a bunch let's of, go. Let's just go to a bunch of little like parks or areas with a bridge and just like pull over like and nature. enjoy the nature. Yeah, it feels uh, kind of lovely. If it, if it weren't for the teens. I'd be if in. it weren't for the t- but they're at night so if you go during the day oh great yeah i mean great and then i'll bring my horseradish sandwich and it'll be beautiful <laughs> i will bring a jar of horseradish and i'll put it in the picnic basket and you and i can go and look at bridges you know someone's stepdad is obsessed with this idea if you have a stepdad Absolutely. in illinois this is his birthday dream to just go to all seven bridges and just be allowed to fucking stare at and it and talk about it all appreciate nature and bridges like what more does a stepdad want right Good which call. makes me wonder are stepfathers the escorts to hell the answer is yes but don't tell tim that i said that well he's the escort to whatever hell comes through trains well i guess the railroad trestles that still works i was gonna say it's pretty pretty spot on if you ask me <laughs> okay renata do not take tim to collinsville illinois he you might be it's in trouble. too late they're probably they're literally probably already there <laughs> um so anyway the very first gate just happens to be near a cemetery um totally unassuming it does say it's sure. unassuming but i feel like if you're seeing a cemetery on your way to the gates of hell it's not that unassuming no um, fits. So there's nothing much to really say about that one. You just kind of pass through, maybe enjoy the cemetery. I actually think cemeteries are very peaceful, so you can make that part of your, like, picnic day. Um, and then half a mile down the road is the second gate. And this one has, like, a lot of prolific lore to it. Mm-hmm. People claim to see, yikes, bodies hanging from the overpass. Oh, which God. adds to the creepy factor. It's giving Bunny Man Bridge yeah which i did see pictures of it it really doesn't look any less similar than bunny man bridge it's just a random fucking bridge that teenagers say at night you'll see shadows hanging from the overpass yeah but if you're a teen in collinsville illinois just get ready that's the one that you gotta be worried about another version of the story is that there were at one point two best friends who fell in love with the same girl and they fell into this rivalry um and some say that in the story, one guy hanged himself on the overpass out of, like, heartbreak because the girl picked his friend. Others say that he killed his friend so that way he could be with the girl. But either Ugh. way, it's the story ends up being that one of them was hanged on the overpass. And now you can see oh their God. shadow at night. Even though there's no record of it, although there, a lot of these were not actually recorded at any point. There's another story that a black man or honestly probably black child uh, was murdered at this bridge by a lynch mob. And I don't know why we're inserting a fun little racist tidbit into uh, an urban legend. An urban legend. Wow. Where there, and uh, like I said, there are very, there are big patches of lynchings that went undocumented. So maybe there really was something, but if there wasn't, then why did anyone create this storyline to begin with? Um, anyway, so it's a, the, whichever version you believe someone was hanged there. Um, and as you drive by, there are said to be ghosts at this bridge. A lot of people swear that they see a man and a boy, um, just standing as you drive by and just stare at you as you drive away straight out of a horror movie yep anyway the second bridge seems to be the one that i like the least so far let's leave it there me too then there's the third and the fourth gates they are both so close to each other in proximity that they are often clumped into each other as just one gate they're called the twin gates um because of how close they are they happen to be surrounded by a patch of woods which feels like just again meant Mm. for a horror movie Mm -hmm. in this patch where the twin gates are apparently this spot is always eerily quiet no birds come here there's no bugs the way that it's like the forestry is is that there's no breeze that comes through no rustling leaves um this one's giving devil's tramping ground 
I was just going to say, what was that circle? <laughs> yeah, the circle, yes. Uh, so imagine that circle, but now with two massive bridges going through it. The only no, sound people hear is of water from a nearby stream. Apparently, part of the ritual is to just park there and just enjoy listening to the water. But the sound often lulls people into thinking that they're hearing something else. And a lot of people have said that they've heard what sounds like another car in the distance approaching them and getting so close that they think it might hit them in their car. Weird. Which, like, how loud must this sound be that you think another car is about to fucking hit you? (laughs) Yeah, I I wonder if it's just because... Maybe it has happened if, like, I mean, if you're a teenager in the middle of the night, maybe you do hear another teenager coming up in the middle of the night. And then it just kind of turned into part of the legend. But Right. I wonder if, like, you hear about it in advance and so it's, like, kind of you're primed for it and then you're listening. You have to sit there and listen to the running water for 10 minutes and it, like, starts it's just trans trancey. Yeah. Yeah, tra- yeah. Yeah. Because, you know, when you listen to, like, people say if you listen to, like, white noise for a long time, you can start, like, hearing things that aren't there um, or staring at something for a long time. Maybe it's that kind of phenomenon. Feels like an Ooh. audio version of, like, Bloody Mary or something where all of a sudden you your brain gets tricked into hearing yeah. or seeing new things. Yeah. Anyway, so that's the Twin Gates where it will be very creepily silent. But once you really focus in on the sounds, you'll start hearing other things that aren't really there. And that's three and four, right? That's three and four. Okay. Um, So, and the really creepy thing, of course, is that a lot of people swear they hear a car coming up to them and then they open their eyes and nothing's there. The sound stops abruptly. Um, But I guess that's how you know that the ritual is working. If all of a sudden you think you're about to get hit by a car. Um, Yeah, you're like, yes, (laughs) we did it. Uh, People who travel to all seven gates have used different gates as spots for occult activities. So this is where I'll tell you that the twin gates, gates three and four, happen to be the most popular, probably because they've got their own name, their own their own legend of like some someone coming up to you. Yeah. But at all seven of these areas, you should be careful about maybe it's not just teens in the woods. Maybe it's nefarious teens in the woods. Oh, so now it's getting Uh, scary uh, in like a real life world too not Uh just paranormal super duper ding 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 christine um Mm. you might run into other people while you're out especially those performing rites after midnight which i guess again is technically a good thing if you're trying to open a portal to hell so maybe you want to find them i don't know um yeah yeah it's all mixed (laughs) signals here like how far it's like i wanted to go through the portal to hell but not like that yeah exactly can't pick and choose it's like i feel like you could at least like keep them within your eyesight and you just kind of follow them through and let them do yeah. all the dirty work but don't like say yeah hi. yeah yeah. you can like keep one eye like keep one foot out the door metaphorically uh-huh, uh-huh, speaking uh-huh. you know like you can run still um so anyway you might run into other people so just a warning um gate five here's another warning there is no good place to pull over so a lot of people even though this is technically against the rules just for safety they do just drive through and not like stop to appreciate it because there's nowhere to do it um it Mm. barely bends in a way that you're not able to even see the bridge until you're already driving through it so um there's really it's kind of just the inconvenient one there's always one you know there's gotta be one attention seeking one you know yeah i wouldn't know who that is in our group but um certainly not me me neither weirdly enough (laughs) <laughs> it could be any of us so the sixth gate is often confused with the nearby acid bridge um, uh, <laughs> acid bridge is people. also haunted so the ghost stories of acid bridge and the potential satanic gates of hell stories of the sixth gate they overlap a lot and so if you hear someone say like oh acid bridge is a gate to hell eh, close but no cigar. Um, allegedly, Noted. Acid Bridge is the most haunted bridge in Illinois. So if you accidentally oh. end up there instead of the Sixth Gate, you're still going to have a good time. You know what I'm saying? I sure do. But I, imagine... In fact, I'd rather go there. It seems like less work than all the other ones. It does. <laughs> Especially when the work so far has been just appreciate nature. Yeah. It's like, ugh, Yeah. Like, like who do you think I am? Ugh. Um, But I will say Acid Bridge, it's... The most haunted bridge in Illinois, but 
can you imagine like accidentally getting there and you're on the sixth of seven gates and you just fucked oh, up the ritual God. I'd, infuriating I'd be, like, be like you know what no now i'm just gonna appreciate this fucking bridge because i'm i'm over it i'm not doing any more forget work. it the road from um we'll talk about acid bridge in a little bit but i just want to finish this out real quick the road from gate six to gate seven there are a lot of long winding turns and it's actually a lot of people like give up and turn around because they think they either missed it or it doesn't exist or they read the rules wrong or um, i'm throwing up because i'm car sick yeah or that and so once you do find it if you pass through gate seven you're supposed to get out of your car and wait or you're supposed to stop just before the gate and wait but either way you are waiting to be greeted by satan himself so you'll be probably waiting a long time um if you wait long enough the story Uh goes that satan himself will escort you through this final gate into hell but if satan if satan is busy he might send a proxy which uh is he'll just send a random demon to greet you so i guess that's where a lot of people will say like i saw a shadow in the woods and i assumed that was my escort you know Um, what the f why do you want that as a 17 year old i can tell you i would have wanted it for sure oh, i, I can't un- I, I like i feel like i would have said i wanted it and then like halfway through it have been like i'm really afraid <laughs> i i would have wanted it so bad i would have wanted like, it so but bad. like what what is the i know that it's teenagers and they don't think th- things through necessarily but like w- in your mind like back way back when what would you envision if you really believed it like what would you think would happen like it would somebody would appear and you'd just run away or would you like follow them into i think hell? if you're like, asking me to think like a 17 year old i i literally like, like my, you yourself yeah right i think my my frontal lobe was not fully developed and i didn't think what would happen next i just wanted oh that. i see i hadn't thought about after okay. the fact i for all, it could oh, have been a literal murderer and i had not thought through the fact that i could be in danger i just wanted to see something Understood. happen so that i was the person <laughs> that had a success story of doing these rituals i would have been like yeah oh, we, it worked and then that's that's where I my mean I ended. yeah I can't I can't deny I mean I would have been with you like there's no doubt that I would have joined in like for sure but uh, I think the whole time I would have been like guys what do we do when the when Satan shows up um, <laughs> so I don't think I would have, have actually prob- thought it was Satan I would I think I would have just wanted something even if it was like a little bunny rabbit to run by that I could have gone home and told everybody oh he was the escort to hell like I. I just right, wanted right. I get yeah, yeah. I, I wanted something that. to happen, but it did not occur to me that that something could be just so bad. Understood. Okay. Thank you for reminiscing. Um, you're welcome. About like seventeen year old me, I was development. I was a dummy, but I was fun. You know, like I was. I mean, <laughs> I yeah. Was, I would have, and time. I was a sucker. I would have gotten sucked right in. If you would tell me, ask me two times the second time, I would have been like, "All right, I'll go." Yeah, yeah. No, I would have. I and I would have probably dragged you on the third time if you were still saying no. So. Um, I would have joined you, yeah, no doubt. Anyway, if you wait long enough, Satan or his proxy, a bunny rabbit, I guess, in my opinion. Um, <laughs> yeah, what the fuck? <laughs> will come greet you. People also often say that they hear dogs in the distance, so they think that that could be like hellhounds escorting them uh-huh. through the final gate. I think people will just find any reason to consider it a success that they, they got there. Well, and I think they did a smart thing by saying you have to just wait as long right as eventually takes, something will like, happen yeah something's gonna happen <laughs> even if it's like a bird flies by or you see headlights in the distance like something will happen and if you wait long enough in the dark you'll get creeped out so exactly um, so what hell actually wants from you is unclear because like once you've entered the portal it's like okay now what like do we that's get what i wonder right is there like a pact a blood pact that i've made and i didn't know like what ha- what happens right next? I think this is where uh, this is no surprise to anybody, but I think the guess is that this is just an urban legend that teenagers kind of do as a tradition in the area. And then they go home because the next bullet I have is if you want out after all of this and like this wasn't fun for you, if you got freaked out, this is how you get out of the seven gates is you just do everything in reverse, which is to me that that just sounds like a U-turn just just go so home. okay but you don't have to reverse through 
No, that would be hysterical and so dangerous. Oh my god, because um, I'm thinking of the winding roads, and I'm like, I'm vomiting in my mouth right now, just <laughs> thinking about how car sick I am. Like, this if you're is doing hell it backwards, you're technically just swallowing it. This is my. <laughs> Okay, gross. So it's just getting worse for me, basically. It's just like my own personal hell. Okay, got it. Although you are the best a reverse driver I've ever met. So if I were to have that with oh, anyone, I would you. want it to be you. Um, That's true. If I'm driving, I won't be car sick. So I'll drive. You tell me what to do. You know I don't know where I am at any given moment. So you do the directions. <laughs> I'll drive. <laughs> and we'll be good. We'll be fine. If you want out, you do everything in reverse except drive in reverse. But um, you okay, start at gate seven and then you do the whole trip six, five, four, three, two, one. As you pass through the first slash the final gate, you are to look in the rear view mirror and glance back as a way of like saying goodbye to your time at oh. that gate. But you're also allegedly supposed to be able to see hell for a moment as you are leaving the area. <laughs> Now, that's um, what I would do. I'd be like, I'll do the safe version, you know? I'll do all this just to look back in the mirror later. Yeah. Locals yeah. who Locals who grew up in this area, they have done the bridge thing and they have seen reflections of eyes in their pictures, like they'd been watched all night. Other people claim that they have mm. seen shadowy ghost dogs or hellhounds. Some people say that they've just heard dogs, but also remember you're like in an area of nature. Maybe someone's just walking their fucking dog, you know? Um, yeah, fair point. One person who used to go all the time as a teenager, a nefarious teenager, said, at night it literally changes. The urban legend pales in the face of the truth. So um, that would have been me at 17. I would have been like, they don't even get it, Sure, man. yeah. <laughs> On your live journal. Yeah. I was like, hmm, wow. Anything else to elaborate? No, just that? Cool. Well, some people said that they would, it was a, a common thing to put flour on your cars and as you would appreciate the nature you'd get oh. out later and see handprints all over the car um mm. a lot of people have claimed to see full bodied apparitions balls of light hear I can weird see the, sounds the stepdad the stepdad now being like you put what on my car i know I'm and it's just like all the hands my perfectly good car <laughs> All the hands are real tiny because they're raccoons, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Just like eating off your car, yeah. <laughs> it's like no, no, that's 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 Satan's escort. It's like, dude, it's <laughs> raccoons. Um, could be both. Could be both. Uh, people have seen full bite apparitions. They've felt a sense of dread. They felt being stared at in the woods, which ghostly or not, I don't like feeling stared at in the woods. It's not. A, um, no, me neither. And. Warning, people have uh, also discovered a lot of animal bones out here, which could be from nature or they could be evidence of sacrifices. People do go out there and still do occult things. So look out. Um, one of the ghosts that people have gotten the pictures of a lot happens to be, according to the legends, the victim of a car crash that happened on this route. And this was by Acid Bridge. So <gasps> the acid bridge story the reason it's called acid bridge is because i'm guessing in like the 70s ish era um this was where a bunch of kids would go and do acid um drug hangout it was it was where all the nefarious teens were i'm telling you this area is just riddled with them my goodness so teens were hanging out on the bridge. They were dropping acid and listening to uh, rock and roll. And God one of the friends, this is a fucking wild version of the story. There are other versions, but this one like really um, lures you in very quickly. It's got a hook. One of the friends who was dropping acid. He's got a hook? A, had, a, had a gun. <laughs> oh, and he fuck. Okay. Started randomly shooting targets for fun. Like just like, oh, there's a tree. Let's see if I can shoot Super. it. Super. Yeah. One of the bullets ricocheted off of the guardrail and hit one of them in the head. <gasps> Homegirl survived, but the <gasps> friends panicked, thought they had killed her, and so they threw her over the bridge. And then they actually killed her because she drowned in the river. Oh the guardrail at this bridge does still have bullet holes in it, but to be fair, <gasps> I would not be surprised if... People have shot at that thing more than once. So I don't know if it's like from point. the actual lore. Anyway, another version is that teens were doing acid by the bridge. And uh, either way, they were speeding through or they were driving through and didn't see headlights in time. But they swerved to avoid a crash and ended up crashing into the actual wall. Um, 
there's a bunch of stories of some sort of car accident with a bunch of teenagers who were being reckless. And uh, it just sounds like there is a ghost from one of these stories that now sits in this area. And a lot of people see her as they drive by. Um, A similar story at the fourth gate, which is one of the twin gates, is that, again, teens were speeding through and they saw another car last minute and swerved, ended up killing themselves. Um, At one of the gates, a ghostly car appears as if, like, you're about to cross each other's paths Mm. and then it follows you in the dark for a while before vanishing. So then some Mm -mm. people think that's the escort to hell driving you or making sure you're getting to hell properly. Or it could be another teenager and you're like, doing this. right. (laughs) It could be any, it could be anything. But as a teenager, my brain would have immediately thought this is part of the ritual. Yeah. Satan drives uh, an 08 Honda. Yeah. He he drives an an F-150 or something. I don't know. And he. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I guess we're in the Bible belt, huh? Okay. (laughs) So anyway, a lot of people see a ghostly car that apparently then vanishes out of nowhere. And like the gates at Acid Bridge, people will leave flour on their car to find handprints. But apparently the handprints here are much smaller, like that of a little girl's. Or like a raccoon. Oh. Or um, a raccoon. <laughs> I have seen enough possums as of Fredericksburg, Virginia. I know they got little you sure thumbs. Have. Yeah, they got something you going sure on. Have. Yep. If you park near Acid Bridge and leave your car unlocked, some spirit or entity might crawl in behind you. But also, if you're leaving your car unlocked in the middle of the night, a human could fucking crawl in there. So this is where I'd rather have a spirit. I think (laughs) I'm only I'm only I know usually I'm all about the like believing things, but we really leaned in heavy that this was going to be an urban legend. And on top of it, as someone who was. A 17-year-old who thought, there's no way I'm being a dumbass and yet only did dumbassery. If you're 17 (laughs) and you're listening to this, please fucking lock your car. I don't care what the urban legends say. Do not just leave it unlocked and wait for somebody to enter. It is not a ghost. It is a literal murderer. Um, Don't don't play around with that. No, no. Do not play around. Always lock your car. Um, So... A lot of people say that something crawls into their car and hides in the back seat. And it's like, I could be Ugh. someone with a literal fucking And weapon. also, like, if it's a ghost, why does the car need to be unlocked? It, does, it doesn't even make uh-huh. sense. Like, can't, can't it get in without unlocking and opening the door? So just right. lock it and it'll get in if it wants to. <laughs> That's the voice of reason that, that, that we needed. Yeah. <laughs> um. Keep in mind, like I said, that's a, yeah, a PSA, like be actually safe, please. <laughs> like a lot of these, I'm all for being 17 and doing things that like your mom would disapprove of probably, but please try to do it with some caution of like, if you're on a yeah, road just... and there's no place to pull over, maybe don't park in the middle of the night and get out. Someone will hit you. Um, don't get yourself killed, please. Yeah. Just be careful. Car crashes in the middle of the night, especially from kids trying to like pull off the seven gates of hell can be common here it is you would not be the first car crash to happen around here in the middle of the night um you could get hit when you're pulled over if you're walking around any of that stuff and there is also the chance of running into actually not so good people especially when there's like i'm not saying a cult is bad but if people are going there because they want to see some something creepy or taboo happen people could be walking around with with not so good intentions uh people could just be partying in the woods or there could be like truly there could be murderers and rapists out in the woods waiting for like a teenager to just walk outside that's what i was gonna say if they know people are gathering there as kids and don't tell their parents then you know it's it's uh exactly not a lot not a big jump not a big leap to to consider the worst possible scenario anyway that is the uh seven gates of hell for our seventh year of conception what Oh, um, you nailed it. Thank you. I'm a little, I feel like I'm still on the Galena train though. Like I, don't I know. did, maybe it's because I said it immediately to you, but I agree. Okay. Uh, like it sounds interesting. I just, Galena I'm sounds like, charming. This is like, this is like Galena's younger brother who like, ha, like, yeah, maybe has some friends in jail and like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, it just seems like. <laughs> Like the bad, the bad boy little brother, but like Galena's like this polished, experienced woman, yeah. you know? And don't get me wrong, like 
as Em said, I absolutely would have been involved in this tomfoolery as a child. But, uh, I, you know, I just don't need to be around teens right now. I'm like, I have a toddler. That's enough. I, if I'm going to go somewhere, I don't really want to be surrounded by, uh, by uh, reckless teens looking Hooligans. for a thrill. You know? Hooligans. Hooligans. <laughs> Although, while we're here, let's do a redemption moment. Oh. Collinsville, Illinois. I want to see what the actual town looks like. Oh, okay. Well, while you do that, I'm going to let Junie in because he threw his body into the wall and scared the shit out of me. Any luck? Okay, so Gal Galena, I, I think it's just because I'm already in love with her. I, I don't right, think Collinsville right. is Galena, but I will tell you, Collinsville, we really buried the lead. And if I already did fun facts about horseradish, I should have handled this too. It looks like Collinsville <laughs> has like the world's biggest ketchup bottle. <laughs> Collinsville, of course Collinsville they really do. does feel like what? they know that they're not Galena, but they have they have the fun. They bring the fun. They like don't need to be, you know. They're like we got our own shit. Col Hang what is on, it? Let me Collinsville. Just, Collin, just I literally just Collins typed in Collinsville, Illinois, and then did images, and the first thing that came up was ketchup bottle. <laughs> do you this see? This is hilarious. Yes, I sure do. It's spelled catsup. Catsup. Yeah, Collinsville um, catsup. I this love it. Wild. Okay, I mean, she's got her own reasons. You know, Colin is about it. Colin's like, I know my big sister Galena is like a little more polished than I am, but we have fucking ketchup and horseradish and ghosts. So wow, yeah, I, I mean, like it. you already got me with the horseradish, obviously, and I'm starting to lean back. You know, I'm kind of into it, and also it's on Route 66, and I feel like that does something for me. You know, yeah. She's a good time. She's a good time. Oh, and she's called Historic Collinsville. And you know that gets me. You know mm. that gets me. Some bricks. Mm. Some painted brick that says Historic Collinsville. I mean, all right, I'm in. It does. You know as they've I told got you at when least we discuss this fucking bridge. It doesn't take much to convince me of anything. So, um, I feel like if I'll be there, you're a place who is really promoting a ketchup situation and a horseradish situation. <laughs> you know, on their main street, they've got a great burger joint. You know, they've got a good fucking oh. sandwich place. Oh, you know they do. Oh, with horseradish, man, that that sounds delightful. Thank you. The end. <laughs> good job em um i've got my little demo demonic entity here uh if you can see oh. him can you see him oh there there's he is. a sweet little kitty oh as soon as you pointed your he, camera he did his little he showed off his claws yeah he said look what i can do i own you um and he sure does okay <laughs> well em i have something special for you today not really i mean Every day with me is special. I know that. But this is the story of the mysterious death of Natalie Wood. Oh, okay. I'm glad you're covering it because, homie, you and I watched this on... Remember how scary that was? I... That, that was out of sight. It. That, so, we again, were before, before Christine says out. anything, I'm going to fully interrupt. I'm going to fully take advantage of the airspace unfortunately for everybody Good. but i need to remind everybody that zach bagans is a business genius i don't yep. like a lot of things about him but that man knows how to keep a brand moving and during covid he mm -hmm. did a series called zach bagans quarantine or whatever and natalie wood was one of the episodes it was and I, I, i'll be honest like i sort of vaguely knew about natalie wood's story back when we first watched that it was when i was visiting la uh at one point um and we were fully ready to just watch this like new installment by zach bagans and kind of like you know poke fun and laugh and drink and whatever and we got genuinely scared like we i've we never been Eva, actually I think, like help we're really afraid <laughs> I had to like slow clap for Zach Bagans because I was like, you know what? I want to hate this man, but you actually got me this time. I'm really just so the, scared. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, now that I've done all this research and actually watched like several documentaries just about Natalie Wood's story, I would be interested to go back and watch that episode with that knowledge because, mm. you know, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I think we can all agree that sometimes for better or for worse, Zach Bagans kind of leans into the 
more sensational side of a story. Um, and so I wonder, you know, looking back, like how he presented it and how mm -hmm. I just want to see like how it lines up with like what I've kind of learned the facts of the case are. Um, yeah. But that that episode, that one shook me up. So uh, if you're looking for something frightening, watch that. But also don't make fun of us if you're not scared. And we were because okay. we were really afraid. <laughs> People are gonna be like, "What's your problem?" It's not that scary. It was only uh, like a four boy. episode series too, which is wild. That like, I how know. in those four <laughs> episodes did we actually get so fucking rocked compared to everything we else he's ever put out? out? You know what? Part of me wonders if like part of the marketing genius was that it was right during like during the start of COVID when we really didn't know what was going on, and so it was almost like. It had this air of like the world is shutting down and I'm yeah. trapped in this, you know, he really leaned it. I remember the opening sequence was like, so far, like 200,000 people across the globe have died. And we were like, oh, you know, this was like four months in. We were like, oh, but it wasn't even I remember like sold. I remember part of the news saying like we're only 15 days in right now. And, and I was like, oh, oh my, my God. God, like. It was something crazy. But the numbers he... were like so small, but they seemed so shocking. So when we watched it a few months later, we were like, oh, buckle up, folks. It's about to get a lot worse than what it was 15 days in. Which does make me wonder, though, because I'm like, he had there's no way. Like, did it just work out perfectly for him that COVID happened? Because they started filming this thing like two weeks into COVID. Like, how fast does his production company move? Like, to be able to like pitch a whole fucking new show idea. This had to be something before hmm. COVID and then COVID just happened. Hmm. I don't it's very interesting, yes? Very suspicious. Mm hmm Quarantine. When did that even come out? Maybe it maybe, maybe we're it was gonna be called something okay. else and then they called it quarantine and then they like read Okay, it came out. The first episode came out June 11th of 2020. So it was, so it was definitely three in. a few months in. Yeah. So at least I imagine maybe they were starting, maybe they were considering production on something or starting production and then like pivoted really hard. I don't know. Because it was yeah. all at on location. So, I mean, they didn't really have to like travel anywhere, you know. Um, yeah. Welcome to today's installment of We Just Analyze Zach's Business Practices for some reason <laughs> and, get, and, get, and get no answers. <laughs> so uh, anyway, let's cover Natalie Wood's mysterious death. Now, um, real quick, before we start, do you know much about the Natalie Wood story or not really? Because I was kind of I only, a I only know it, what Zach Bagans told us. Oh, I God. Okay, Zach here Bagans we go. Us. Natalie Wood, she was born Natalia Nikolivna. Zaharenko. Okay, I wanted to get that right. Mm -hmm. uh, and she was born of Russian immigrant parents. That was her given birth name on July 20th, 1938 in San Francisco. When she was five, the producer and studio executive William Getz, who would put her in her first film, changed her name uh, from Natalia to Natalie to kind of Americanize it. Mm -hmm. And then um, with the name zaharenko he said i'll, I'll make it wood <laughs> so okay. okay he changed it to wood which was apparently in honor of his friend a director named sam wood you know whatever i have thoughts on that it was the 40s you could i guess just name people whatever you wanted um yep so Natalie Wood, uh, allegedly this is part a big part of the story um and actually i, I say allegedly but Quite a few people have confirmed it. A fortune teller told Natalie's mother, Maria, when she was pregnant, that she would have a famous daughter. And that same fortune teller was also said to have predicted that daughter would someday die in dark water. Oh, my God. Okay. What kind of fucking terrible psychic, by the way. Get some ethics. Like, I mean, like, what a great that's... psychic, but a little too to the point, you know? But, like, maybe... Yeah, like no bedside manner. Just... Up a little bit. Yeah, no bedside manner. Indeed. Yeah, that's a good way to put it. So Natalie did indeed achieve fame. Um, and apparently she actually grew up with a phobia of water because her mom, maybe not the best move, told her about this psychic or this fortune teller and said, this fortune teller told me that Oof. you would die in dark water someday. And so there are several interview clips where Natalie Wood says she's terrified of water. And um, so whether the fortune teller said it or not, whether that part was real, um, she definitely did grow up with a fear of water based on what her mom had told her. 
which makes it even creepier if like the in and of it's itself like, yeah yeah it's like oh it's so like in her gut then she would have known something there's was something off about water. that stuck exactly there's like something for her that really stuck um i had that exact same thought so Natalie began dancing ballet and acting at a really early age. Her first small film role was at four years old. But in 1947, she took on her first major starring role in a movie called Miracle on 34th Street. Mm. And of course, we know that became a huge Christmas classic. Um, and she kind of was vaulted into fame after that. And while filming the 1949 feature two years later, The Green Promise, um, a kind of traumatic incident happened where the bridge that Natalie was running on actually collapsed and she broke her wrist and fell into the water. And this made her even more terrified of water than before. So she's kind of, it's almost like building on itself. Hmm. Natalie's career then really took off as a teenager when she starred uh, alongside James Dean in the 1955 hit rebel without a cause. And, uh, she actually received uh, an Academy Award nomination for that role. So now wow. she's becoming an A-lister. And it's interesting to watch people cover this kind of progression of her acting because people have pointed out it's difficult for a child star, you know, to transition right. into that, like, adult or even teenage role of, like, rebel without a cause, like, love interest, you know. But she really right. did it very well. Um, and I think that's a testament to how good she really was as an actor. And uh, in 1961, going off that, she famously starred as Maria in the Hollywood adaptation of West Side Story. So Man, she just had that, fucking big hit after big hit after big hit. Hit after hit. And she really was like a Hollywood star, you know, um, she was a dancer, but she wasn't a singer. So she didn't actually sing in this role. Uh, a Broadway actress named Marnie Nixon sang the part for her. Mm. Um, but you know, if you watch it and you know, it's, it hasn't aged well in that, uh, you know, there are white people playing Puerto Rican folks and all that, but, uh, she really did again, kind of, um, cement her A-list status, uh, as, as Maria. So Natalie herself outside or off the screen was charming and adorable in person. People loved her. She was like very easy to follow. You know, she was very easy like um, tabloid fodder or like Hollywood news fodder. Like people just loved following her, her story. Sure. And there was one documentary. It's called Natalie Wood, What Remains Behind. And the, they put it this way. Generations of people watched her grow up. And I just thought that was so cool because it was like people saw her as a child actress and then watched her as she became a teenager and was yeah. in Rebel Without a Cause. And then, you know, she just got uh, more and more famous, almost like alongside them growing up as well. But of course, you know, Hollywood is not all glitz and glamour. Um, she was under contract. She was sometimes forced to do projects she didn't want to do, whether that was like the film companies forcing her to do them or her mother pressuring her to do them. Um, but Apparently, she and her younger sister, Lana, were both put under tremendous pressure by their mother, Maria, who is said to be a very, very classic, like, big persona, like, kind of, um, what do you call it? Like, when you're stage mom? Like a pageant mom. Yeah, stage mom. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Exactly. And so there was a lot of pressure there. And that's why a lot of times people kind of question some of the stories, like, about the psychic and the fortune teller. It's a little shady because people say they can't necessarily trust um, what came from her mother. Sure. But we do know that she was a very, uh, very obsessive uh, parental figure when it came to all the, the Hollywood stuff. She was taught from a young age that she could not leave the house unless she looked absolutely perfect. Uh, she Yeesh. was raised to be very obsessive about her appearance um, to the point of destroying her own sister's wedding photos because she didn't like how she looked in them and she <gasps> felt so self-conscious that she just destroyed them uh Ooh, so there's a real wow. deep complex here that had been had been built um and just in case you need a cherry on top natalie's mom was known to tell the press god made natalie but i invented her ew that gives me goose camp <laughs> I invented Ugh. her. Ooh, that Ugh. that woman's got a 
a she would just a, a psychiatrist would love to work with her <laughs> or hate to I would I would or hate to right I was like well <laughs> so in 1955 when Natalie was just 15 her mother dropped her off at a hotel for an important meeting that supposedly was going to make or break her career um, her mom waited outside in the car with Natalie's sister Lana and Natalie was ushered into a private suite with Kirk Douglas, um, who, you know, we all know now, um, but was back then also an extremely famous and powerful actor at the time. He was nearly 40 years old. Um, and it wasn't until they were adults that Natalie told her sister Lana uh, what had happened at that hotel. And in her words, Kirk Douglas hurt her. Hmm. Okay. So that's what we know. Uh, we don't know real details of that uh but it sure doesn't sound good nope maria told natalie um that accusing kirk douglas would ruin her career so this is her mother talking so she just had to suck it up and that was that oh lovely 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 um now this one speaking of getting goose cam and feeling icky all over uh later in life apparently natalie banned her mom from entering her own home her home natalie's home when she overheard her mother on the baby monitor telling her infant daughter so like maria's granddaughter right. telling her granddaughter that she would make the baby girl a star one day <gasps> and that nobody loved the baby as much as she did oh oh my god oh my god this is so toxic which like um, it's like it's extra horrible because i i you've already listed a few things that like where natalie was dealing with things but i'm sure there's mm. so much more beneath that like the tip of the oh, iceberg yeah. for her to be like you will not touch my child like yeah 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 right like that's oof. the final straw it's yeah. like that must have been enough to say nope we're done um so she kicked her out said don't come back and Natalie and Lana, um, because they were great mothers, uh, became really adamant about protecting their own daughters from mm -hmm. Maria. They didn't want their children to have the same childhoods they had. Um, and Natalie was especially strict about this. Uh, she was hugely popular in the press. Uh, her fans were obsessed with her, obsessed with the details of her life, especially her love life. She had actually dated several very high profile stars, including Elvis Presley, of all Whoa. people. Yeah. And so in 1957, she entered her first marriage. And this was with actor Robert Wagner. And she was oh. 18 and just turned 18. And he was eight years older than her. Uh, and mm -hmm. so any diciness there aside, because they hadn't known each other for a long time, uh, they actually divorced five years later because... Uh, Natalie caught him having an affair and the way he puts it now is that because he's in a lot of these documentaries the way he's kind of described it is that he couldn't handle her being more popular more famous than he was and you know she oh so he was an insecure these... man what? yeah right exactly and and okay. that's what he claims today is the reason that their first marriage fell apart okay so she was devastated by the divorce um, after her relationship with Warren Beatty uh, ended, because why not? She <laughs> began seeing another guy who was in the industry. This was Sidney Pollock, who was a married man and the director of a film she was starring in. Uh oh. And yep, bad news. So Natalie loved him, but he was unwilling to leave his wife for her. And when he actually ended their affair, she was totally inconsolable and actually attempted suicide in 1966 oh, shit. Uh, because this had hit her so hard um thank god one of her close friends intervened took her to the hospital and her life was saved and at this point um wisely i think she took a break from acting to focus on therapy and recovery um which seemed to go pretty well uh she seemed to kind of become more secure in herself and uh i don't know pick herself back up from rock bottom she married writer and producer Greg Richardson in 1969 and had a daughter with him, uh, who, whom she named Natasha. Mm -hmm. And then she divorced him in 1972. So they were only together for a couple years. And then, you better believe the tabloids love this shit. What? She got back together with her first husband, Robert Wagner. And they oh. said they were always meant to be. And they fell back in love. And 
got married again, and the two of them had another daughter together named Courtney in 1974. Mm-hmm. So when L- Lana asked Natalie about this decision, <laughs> just take all this, I guess, with a, I don't know. I don't know the right word, but I'm just going to say A rock of it. salt? A boulder of salt? What? <laughs> a boulder of salt? Right, yes. Uh, so, you know, she said, oh, we're in love. We're getting married again. But apparently when Lana asked Natalie about the decision, Natalie said, sometimes the devil you know is better than the devil you don't. Great. So he was Red the lesser flag. of all evils. So the lesser devil, the he lesser was demon. the bare minimum shitty man. Is what yeah, I'm I hearing. suppose. I suppose so. She definitely put it that way, at least. Um, so Lana later said, "I would have really liked to hear I love him dearly and I can't live without him, something like that. But to give me a quote about devils, it really didn't sit well." Right. Yeah. Totally. It's like, well, yeah. he's fine compared to the others. It's like, yeah. Yeah. You worse. could just not be married, girl. It's okay. Yeah. Yeah. It could be worse. Um, but to be honest, things seem to go pretty smoothly in their second marriage. I think he really tried harder this time around. Um, he, he claims he had grown up a lot since their first marriage. And so things seemed pretty smooth. They were raising the girls together. And through the 70s, Natalie continued to enjoy her successful acting career in film and TV. She refused to pull any strings or even arrange introductions for her younger sister, Lana, because she wanted Lana to make it in Hollywood by her own merit, not because she was setting things up for her. And Lana did achieve uh, a successful acting career, but of course, you know, not quite as tremendously big as Natalie did. So in 1981, Natalie was wrapping up a sci-fi thriller called Brainstorm, and she was preparing to kick off rehearsal for a stage production of Anastasia. And she had joined a new production company. She was excited about exploring new projects that were coming up, um, new genres she could explore. And Lana remembers 43-year-old Natalie being very happy and just excited about the future at this point in time. And apparently her daughters were her whole world. So Lana later wrote, Natalie had the home and family and children she'd wanted all her life. So late 1981, Natalie and her husband, Robert Wagner, start planning a routine trip to Catalina Island, which is 22 miles off the coast uh, from Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. We and, love Catalina uh, Island. You know, we, we're all about Catalina. Uh, I've actually never been. <laughs> but oh, you would love it. I know. My brother went, and that's where he ended up in the hospital. We talk about that a lot on Beach Tea Sandy because he <laughs> only ate Oreos and beef jerky for three days on a hiking trip and got heat stroke. So, uh, <laughs> Yeah, Allison and it, I had a great time. Uh, no heat it has stroke it, over it here. has it all. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, that is something that they did all the time. They took a boat out to Catalina, and they had a boat who uh, boat and a boat captain who drove the boat? Question mark. I need to I need to look at my boat lingo. Captain um, the boat. Ca- See, but the thing is, they said he wasn't even a captain. I don't know the right word. I'll get to it. I'm sure it's in my bullet points. Okay. Okay. So they did their usual. They took a routine trip to Catalina Island, which is, like we said, very close to LA. It's a popular, like, w- long weekend spot, I would say, for people in Los Angeles. Um, and they invited along several friends, and a few declined because they'd heard, like, the weather was going to be a little bit rough, making the water a bit rough. And she really wanted someone else to join them. So in the end, they did manage to get uh, one of her friends to join. And this friend was her co-star in Brainstorm. And his name was Christopher Walken. (laughs) Wow. So, so, yeah, Christopher Walken joined them on their boat ride. So the three of them set off. Uh, It was Robert, Christopher, and Dennis Davern. He was the yacht's... uh, pseudo captain something pseudo captain let's say captain you know what i don't know that's what most people say technically he's the skipper i guess uh but he was the one who managed the boat he took care of the boat he worked on it when the boat went out um he's not technically the captain but that's kind of how he gets portrayed he's driving them along and he's responsible for the boat which by the way is called the splendor and which probably I shouldn't be saying is a boat because it's a yacht. And I'm sure that that's something I would get in big trouble for. Sure. It's sure. a yacht. It's called the Splendor with a U. Splendor. Okay. Splendor. And 
It's been a November 28th was the day they took off. Um, they moored the Splendor just offshore and used a dinghy to go ashore for dinner at Doug's Harbor Reef. And in case you're unfamiliar, a dinghy is basically a little boat um, that goes on your big boat. And then you can hop on the little boat to get to shore instead of like bringing the entire yacht with you, you know. So they went out to dinner. And apparently they drank so much wine that night that the restaurant manager was actually worried about them navigating the dinghy through the water back to their boat. Um, So that's just to give you an idea of how drunk they were. And when they left at 1030, the manager of the restaurant actually sent a member of the Harbor Patrol with them to make sure they made it back to the Splendor safely. And with that escort, uh, they did. They made it back to the Splendor. But after that, As you can imagine, the story gets complicated because Mm -hmm. there are different versions, different theories um, about what really happened. But just after 11 p.m., the three men, this is their official story, realized Natalie was missing. They also realized the dinghy was missing. That was at 11 p.m. At 1.30 a.m., Robert made a ship to shore call to ask that people look around for Natalie in town in case she had gone back to town. Mm -hmm. Two hours later at 3.30 a.m., Robert was finally convinced by others to reluctantly call the Coast Guard to report his wife missing. And this was four and a half hours after they had first noticed that she wasn't there anymore. And this is, sorry, sorry, sorry. So as of 11... They noticed she was missing, but the Harbor Patrol guy did see her with them. So the Harbor Patrol guy saw them leave at 1030 from the restaurant and. And it was all four of them at the time. Saw them all four of them, saw all four of them arrive or I'm sorry, the three of them arrive back on the boat and um, Dennis was on the boat. Okay. Like okay. He's just, so he's just an employee, basically. Sure. But the so Harbor Patrol guy did see her at 1030 with them. Yes, they made it safely to the boat. They left okay. the restaurant at 1030. He escorted them safely all back to the boat. So there's a half okay. hour window where all of a sudden she went missing and we don't know what happened in between then. Allegedly, yes, okay. precisely. So the story is, right, they get back safely to the boat. Thank you for uh, bringing us safely here, escorting us. We're all good now. Bye. Uh, that's around 1030-ish. And then around 11, allegedly, the three men realize Natalie is nowhere to be seen. Mm-hmm. Um And so it's not till 3.30 a.m. that Robert finally calls the Coast Guard to report his wife missing. Then at 8 a.m., tragically, searchers found Natalie floating, having drowned in the water that last night, roughly a mile from the yacht in a cove called Blue Cavern Point. And pretty quickly, police ruled Natalie's death an accidental drowning. Um, Robert told police Natalie must have taken the dinghy out to go party hopping on other nearby yachts. Uh, and when they did an autopsy, it revealed she did have a blood alcohol content of 0.14. And Oof. so with that alcohol uh, impairing her coordination, Robert and investigators assumed she had just fallen off the dinghy at some point while trying to get to another boat. But everybody else who knew her was a little confused because, first of all, Natalie was discovered only in her nightgown and a coat. Mm. Uh, And her sister Lana said that makes no sense. Like, she wouldn't even go get the mail without putting makeup and her hair together and putting on a nice outfit. Like, you know, as we said, our mother put a lot of very intense um, obsessions in her, including her her outward image and so it just didn't make sense to people who knew her that she would go party hopping in her pajamas basically right right. um it just didn't strike them as as likely it was also inconceivable that uh she would go out into the water alone in the dark on a choppy night right like it, it it just felt so unlike her uh especially because with her fear of water she had never learned to swim Mm -hmm. so it just seemed very strange with this fear of water fear of drowning which she had talked about on live tv uh she got in the dinghy and went off without telling anyone in her pajamas it just struck family and friends as a little bit odd years later dennis Uh, The skipper of the boat recalled that when the news broke that Natalie was found dead, 
Robert was, quote, very serious about having the stories be the same. He apparently told the three men aboard, so that was himself, uh, Dennis, and Christopher Walken, told them to have a timeline together before they talked to the police, leading Mm. up to Natalie's death before they were questioned. So Robert and Christopher Walken then left in a police helicopter, leaving Dennis to officially identify Natalie's body because Robert said he didn't want to do it. So Mm. that seems like the definition of above my pay grade right totally. like he's your yacht skipper and you're like anyway go identify my wife's dead body while we go in the helicopter back to shore <laughs> it's and just also, so wasn't christopher walken like christopher walken didn't know them that well right didn't he like just meet her on a on a movie set or something so they were starring together on this film and they had been really good friends oh, okay and there's a lot of speculation because people said People were speculating whether they were having an affair, like before all this happened. Um, And there's a lot of speculation about Robert being jealous of her friendship with Christopher Walken. Gotcha. And they were, you know, like co-stars and they had that kind of um, chemistry. And so they were, she and Christopher Walken were much friendlier than Robert and Christopher Walken, if that makes sense. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. So they left in this police helicopter. Poor Dennis had to identify Natalie's body. Uh, And following Robert's order, Dennis told the police he figured Natalie must have left on the dinghy by herself. It wasn't until years later that he came forward and said there's a major problem with that story. Mm. He said if Natalie wanted to go to a party, she no doubt would have asked him, Dennis, to take her in the dinghy not to go she would not go by herself he was like she would have asked me to take her right he was also literally it's, hired to do that yes exactly that was his job and he's not drunk right like they're they're all out partying drinking he's just their employee he's yeah moving i'm trying to vote i'm trying to imagine a world where like she was so drunk she was like i can i can do it or like maybe i need to face my fears and i don't know what i'm so scared like i'm trying to think of a but then also her pajamas and everything is there a way that the I'm dinghy trying- just like got loose and like that's a separate thing from her just like falling off the boat yes so there are theories about that um, okay so you're you're definitely on to one of the theories with that so i will i will get there um but like you said this was dennis's job so he says you know if they're claiming oh she went to go party hopping like that doesn't make sense she wouldn't have done that by herself she didn't even know according to dennis how to operate the dinghy and so she couldn't have taken it herself it just didn't Mm -hmm. makes sense and indeed the dinghy was discovered washed ashore on some rocks with the key in the ignition but the key had never been turned so she had never even started looks like a setup dinghy yeah Mm -hmm. precisely the the engine had never been started the oars were fixed in place as well meaning the dinghy wasn't even manually rowed by anybody it had just been kind of let go Mm -hmm. but with all three men having told investigators the same story you know they just kind of went with it uh however looking back natalie did have bruises on her body and a cut on her cheek but it was kind of overlooked as like that must have happened when she fell overboard you know right they did also find a broken bottle of wine in the yacht but robert said it had fallen and shattered in some rough sailing conditions and that was his explanation two weeks after natalie died they closed the case and that was that but lana Her sister was really, really struggling with this uh, kind of just open and shut case Mm -hmm. uh, angle on her sister's death. And after Natalie died, Robert just completely cut Lana out of his life, like just totally cold, cold shouldered ghosted her. Lana continually asked Robert, uh, despite him, you know, closing the door on that their relationship as in-laws, continually asked him to explain what happened to Natalie that night and how, what happened when she died, what happened before, what, what was the situation? She just wanted more clarity and she really didn't have any details and was obviously traumatized by this. So she's asking just, I want to know the events leading up to it. Um, And she thought maybe having more information would help her grieve and understand this and heal from it. But Robert basically told her, I'm not talking about it and don't, 
speak to me. Huh. Totally cut okay. her off. So he criticized Lana for selling some of Natalie's estate, like her valuable clothes. And that's something that Lana has been kind of crit- criticized for. But Lana, who was divorced and really hadn't quite hit big time Hollywood status, as Natalie had, uh, said she was just trying to support her daughter. There was a little bit of that back and forth. And then Robert made her sign legal documents, giving up any other claim to her sister's estate. And she was forced to sign those papers, and then he immediately stopped speaking to her altogether. He invited Lana's mother, Maria, who was still alive, and even Lana's daughter over for dinner all the time, regularly. But Lana was not welcome. So Interesting. Strangely, you know? Uh, Lana continued to try to find more work behind the scenes in Hollywood, but like she just wasn't, I don't know, she wasn't the star that her sister was. And so she struggled to kind of find those same type of opportunities. One day, she was allegedly contacted by a trusted source and told she would never find work there again because Robert Wagner had blacklisted her. <gasps> He's so fucking guilty. I don't know what's going on. (laughs) Something so fishy is happening right now. Something is so fishy on some side. And it's like, it's hard because you watch one documentary that features Robert Wagner and Natalie's kids. And they're like, yo, Lana's crazy. She just wants like, she's like her, her mother. She just wants like all this drama and she wants to create this storyline about herself and that's why we cut her out and you're like okay i can see why you would not want that in your life and then you flip it and watch a different documentary with like police investigators who are like this is not like something's wrong with this picture of the way this investigation was handled so you really do see conflicting sides um it's it's something's fishy you're i mean you're absolutely right something's up um one of them knows something that's all I got. Somebody say. knows in, indeed. I absolutely agree. So apparently Lana struggled to understand why he was so hostile toward her and wished he would just like meet with her once to to get this on the table and and figure it out once and for all and discuss her sister's death. But meanwhile, Robert insisted that Dennis, the skipper of the boat, the yacht, excuse me, move into his guest house in Beverly Hills. So he, like, basically pressured this employee who was there the night Natalie died into moving onto his own property into the guest house. Mm. And apparently when he did do this, uh, Robert insisted that Dennis remain indoors at all times and communicate with no one. Oh, my God. And that's according to Dennis's take on how this all went. Okay. Okay. So Dennis said he moved in thinking like, okay, well, he wants me to live closer, maybe, I don't know, be more involved with his day-to-day life. But he said once he moved in, he felt like a prisoner and he said he just had to get out of there. So he eventually made a getaway to the East Coast. He said he had to flee basically as far as he could to get away from Robert. And uh, apparently he really struggled at this point um, and kind of had to come to terms with everything that had happened. And it wasn't until the 90s that he started drunkenly calling Lana to tell her that her sister Natalie's death was not an accident. (gasps) I mean. Yeah. I mean. I mean, but also, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So this is where, obviously, the paths diverge, right? Because... On the one hand, you've got Dennis and Lana, who are making very big claims, who are writing books about this, who are getting paid for these books and getting press. And, of course, you've got the family saying, like, look, they're just, like, money hungry. They're just trying to profit off our mother's death and yada, yada. And then you've got the other side, which is like, well, maybe the guilt was eating at them or maybe maybe this really is how it happened and they're trying to get her story out there so there's a lot of conflict here um oh my god so many question marks so many question marks. there's someone there's someone with like the red string all over their walls like there's totally i think there's probably a lot of people who do and you know what i realized remember in that episode of um quarantine the zach bagan show the guy on the zoom call was dennis oh that was dennis oh that was dennis 
Yeah, I remember him because I was like, why is that guy so familiar? And then I was like, oh, right. He scared me a lot in that one episode of mm-hmm. Zach Bagans. Yeah, he was distraught. Um, he was like just sobbing. He was upset. Because like him he was and- really, really upset. Because even though, so Dennis was technically like the skipper of the boat, but it sounded like mm-hmm. they were like best friends. It sounded like yes, he- Yes, they'd been very close. Yeah. So that mm-hmm. that goes to the point of like- she would have asked him to drive her to a party or something. Like, right, exactly. And he knew her very well. So, like, he knew, like, Natalie wouldn't have gotten on the dinghy by herself. She didn't even know how to drive it, you know? Yeah, like, he yeah. knew those kind of things. And like you said, they had a relationship that he'd been working for this family for years. And they'd done this trip to Catalina so many times that yeah. it, he just knew well enough. So, basically, the situation now is, like, either he's lying, like, just blatantly lying. He didn't look like he was lying on quarantine well certainly not and and that's you know where you get into the he said she said either he's lying or he really believes that's what happened um and so you know (laughs) the question marks remain but i'll tell you i lean one way but we'll get there Mm -hmm. um so after nearly two decades of refusing to speak about his wife's death robert finally said he would open up and talk about his wife's death He was interviewed and he told the story, but interestingly, his story was different this time. Hmm. Convenient. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Interesting. This time, he said Natalie didn't take the dinghy out. Instead, she was below deck going to bed. And because the dinghy was loosely tied, it was banging against the side of the boat. And to, for what it's worth, this was something apparently that had driven her crazy in the past like when the dinghy would clank against the side of the boat and she was trying to sleep down there Mm -hmm. so he said his theory is that she went out just grabbed a coat went out to go retie the dinghy so it would stop banging uh and fell in and that was his new theory okay that makes more sense that's a it makes some sense it's a good lie Uh, yeah if it's a lie it's it if it's a lie, then it's it, it's a sensible one, I think, especially if it was something that really bothered her. Um, in 2011, now this is 30 years after Natalie's death, investigators reopened the case. Mm. Okay. Yeah, because some new information had come to light. So <gasps> was Lieutenant it from Zach John- Bagans? What was it? <laughs> in 2011? No, I don't think so. Um Lieutenant John Carina of the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department basically says Robert's story makes no fucking sense, is essentially. I like him. I like this guy. (laughs) The Cliff's notes of it. Yeah. He said, quote, the reality is that's not her job. She would never go worry about the dinghy. She's going to tell Dennis Stavern, hey, can you go tie that dinghy down? It's making noise. That's his job. Mm -hmm. Which is like, again, the same kind of thing about like with with driving her somewhere to a party. Like that is not something that she ever would have done on her own and so he's like she would have just said even if she was like really pissed she would have said dennis retie that thing Mm -hmm. it's fucking making noise whatever you know and so it just didn't make sense to to uh the lieutenant investigators also called into question the bruises that had been found on natalie's body which actually (laughs) now that they thought about it didn't seem very consistent with falling off a boat oh okay yeah detective ralph hernandez said I think I've been a cop long enough to see that those appear to be assaultive in nature. Oh, okay. Mm. So now we get back to Dennis, the skipper. He's kind of like the crux of all this, right? Mm -hmm. So Dennis, according to him, the night before Natalie's death, she and Robert, her husband, got into a heated argument. She was so upset she had Dennis take her to shore where she stayed the night in a hotel. But Dennis is considered a problematic witness because uh, when he finally changed his story years after the incident, incident, like I told you, he sold it to tabloids and he wrote a tell all book. So people are like, it's just hard to use him as like an impartial witness when he's made so made like he's not impartial anymore. He's like definitely inserted himself into the opinions. Exactly. And so whether it's true or not, it's like it's just hard to rely on that uh, as fact Mm -hmm. so dennis for what it's worth insisted that he came forward um not just not for money at all but just for his own conscience and because he felt like he needed to say something um but 
What we do know is Natalie did call a friend from ashore that night and asked them to come to Catalina to get her and take her back to the mainland. So this was the night before she died. So a friend basically said, oh, she called me and said, I want to come home. I had a I had an argument with Robert and I left the yacht. And so we do know from another separate witness, a friend of Natalie's, that she did, in fact, get into an argument and leave the yacht and go to a hotel because she called her friend. Mm -hmm. But even though she wanted to go home, uh, the rain and the choppy seas prevented Natalie from getting there. So in the morning after cooling down, she decided, you know what, I'm going to go back to the Splendor. I'm going to try to enjoy the rest of my trip and get over this argument we had. But apparently that night when the three of them returned to the boat after dinner at 1030 when when the um, what was he called? The harbor guy helped mm -hmm. get them to the boat. When they returned, Dennis claimed that Robert angrily smashed a bottle of wine on the counter after walking in and seeing Christopher Walken and Natalie kind of just like laughing and, and kind of leaning toward each other, just not, you know, almost flirtatiously, not kissing or anything, but just being but very... like a jealous man would read it the wrong way. Correct. Like yeah. it, it just read as they're having such a good time together. They click so well. Clearly, this was just pouring, you know, gasoline on the fire. Which makes he sense because if their if their first divorce was because he was insecure, he I, this was insecure, can't be and he's only she's only gotten more powerful and like famous and more since then. and more self assured, and mm -hmm. you know, and so at this point, according to Dennis, he walks in. He's immediately enraged he smashes a wine bottle and he shouts at christopher walken what are you trying to do fuck my wife whoa and that is the story dennis tells uh apparently at this point natalie was fed up she went off to bed and said this, i'm out of here went to bed apparently christopher walken went to his room robert followed natalie trying to like keep the argument going, shouting, throwing stuff, making a whole racket. And Dennis said he went to try to intervene in the argument, but Robert like freaked out at him now. And, and Dennis said it, he was so upset and enraged that Dennis was afraid for his own safety and was yeah. like, okay, you know what? I'm out of here. Like <laughs> above my pay grade once again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so he's like, I'm out of here. This is a clearly a marital thing that I'm not getting involved in, but he claimed he could still hear all the commotion. So he said the argument continued outside to the back of the boat, and then there was sudden and complete silence. Wow. Hmm. Hmm. So that is Dennis's story. And in 2018, uh, a 48-hour special came out, and in this special, investigators said two new witnesses had actually come forward to corroborate Dennis's story. These witnesses claimed they heard an argument outside, recognized the voices of Robert and Natalie, and said the argument just suddenly ended in silence. So soon afterward, Dennis found Robert crying. And Dennis was like, what's going on? Is everything okay? Where's Natalie? And Robert said, Natalie is missing. But okay. Perfect. Like I tell, like I said, perfect. So like I said, in the early timeline, Robert refused to let Dennis turn on the floodlights to look for her in the water. Right. Like he, he's like, let's find her. And he's like, no, don't turn on the floodlights. Don't call anyone. And so it, he, he wanted to force them to wait mm. hours, four and a half hours before they called the Coast Guard. That man is prime suspect number one to me i'll, tell I'll you be that. honest i don't feel good about it i'll tell you that much it sounds Even like after he watching... threw her overboard and didn't want any lights because he didn't want anyone to find her struggling so he'd have time for her to drown that's what yeah like to or me. yeah something like that or he knew what he'd done and he was just like trying to hold off as long as he could yeah you know something Something not legal or good or nice. The thing is, like, she didn't know how to swim, so it wouldn't even have been a long wait, you know? It's not like she could have been treading water and right, saying... Right, right. ...and shouting, you know, which is also so upsetting to think about. Um, But yeah, so he had them wait, which is factual. We know that the story that Robert tells is that she went missing at 11, and they didn't call the Coast Guard till 3.30. So we do know that's true. Um, But Lana... 
now believes Robert is responsible for Natalie's death, and she openly accuses him of foul play. But again, Natalie's own daughters um, are very close with their dads. They're, they're separate fathers, but they're both very close with both of their dads and uh, claim that this was all just an accident. So it's hard because you see these two girls who like lost their mother and they're like, no, my, of course my dad didn't do that, you know? And so you want to believe them and you want them to be right, but it's so hard to wrap I your head I can't think this. of a way where it's not, you know. Yeah. I don't, I mean, I am, I'm not an expert, but I do have gut feelings and I do yeah. have, I have some wherewithal. It, it doesn't some seem wherewithal. like. It doesn't seem like there's a lot of options here on what could have happened. It's just a little too shady. Um, Some people seem a little more damning than others, you know? Yeah, I would absolutely agree. Um, So Robert, who's now 93 years old, Mm -hmm. uh, continues to maintain his innocence. In the HBO documentary, Natalie Wood, What Remains Behind, uh, which came out in 2020, Robert sat with Natalie's first daughter, Natasha, and discussed the night Natalie died in more detail. And Natasha said she personally remembered that the dinghy did often irritate her mother. And she had frequently asked Robert to go move it so it would stop banging on the hull. So in some sense, I guess if they're in an argument and she hears it and she's annoyed, she's like, fine, I'll do it myself. You know, I guess I could see that Mm -hmm. being the situation. But she asked in the documentary... So this is now uh, his daughter, or, or I guess his daughter, his first, do- his stepdaughter, <laughs> let's put it okay. that way, his stepdaughter. But she said she calls them both, she calls him like Daddy Wagner. So she calls them by, she calls them both dad. Okay. Uh, that's how close they are. But she asked him how it feels to be considered a person of interest in the reopened investigation. I like how she's like one of the only people who can probably ask him that directly. Right? Yeah. Without, without like What's any... like to know you might be a murderer? Oh, my God, Dad, isn't that weird? Yeah. (laughs) So he told her he doesn't pay any attention because the media uh, and the investigation cannot redefine or change who he is or the truth. Uh, And Natasha said, but it's important to me, Daddy, that people think of you the way that I know you are. Mm. And she says in the documentary she knows Robert would have given his life for for Natalie, for her mother, and that she doesn't want anyone to think otherwise. Now, Natasha's younger sister, Courtney said of the accusations it was so transparent that certain people exploited my family like this and it makes me very protective of my father i love him so deeply and it has gone on for so long that i still can't believe they actually write such untrue things so they've really split from their aunt lana um obviously Mm -hmm. and Today, Lana remains very vocal and convinced that Robert was somehow involved in her sister's death, but the rest of the family just wishes she would stop accusing him, let them move on once and for all, leave this in the past. But of course, you know, people don't like to let stories like this die. So tabloids continue to run stories accusing Robert. Um, But basically, it's a he said, she said, you know, Dennis, Robert and Lana have their each have their own stories of what happened. None of them can be fully proven or disproven. And as of May 2022, so uh, a year, almost two years uh, since recording this episode, Robert Wagner was finally officially cleared of involvement in Natalie's death by the Los Angeles County Sheriff's Department. Um, That being said, the case remains open and unsolved, and investigators do still welcome any new information, um, any witnesses who have yet to come forward to help clarify events uh, that might lead to answers as to what happened to Natalie that night in 1981. The hell happened with what's Christopher Walken's opinion of this? Oh, so he's actually been asked repeatedly, and he has never, he says, I don't speak about that. Wow. Wow. Yeah, there's there wow. there are a few clips I saw where he's been asked. They say, you know, we have to ask, and he says, I understand. I'm not going to speak on that. Either he knows nothing, or he definitely knows something, and he's or scared. he knows everything. Right? Yeah. Isn't that crazy? Like, that feels like I mean, I don't. Maybe there's a world where Robert Wagner didn't do anything, but it feels like he's been threatened into silence. It, that's it feels like either he my my take is almost not even threatened because i feel like christopher walken would be like fuck you and your threats my take is that he doesn't necessarily know 
because he was like, I'm out of here. They're having a marital spat. I'm going to bed. But yeah. maybe he has an idea or maybe he... He's like, I'm just going to keep my mouth shut because... Yeah, yeah. Yeah. It's almost like maybe he doesn't have any hard facts, but he has like an inkling, you know, is the vibe I get. But again, I don't... This is all conjecture. I have no idea. I mean, my hope would be maybe someday on like Christopher Walken's deathbed or something he yeah. like or, or writes a tell all right before he, you know what i mean like maybe we'll find a journal i don't know I, I i wish there were more answers but it is so shady so fishy and like just really tragic i mean overall just really fucking sad you know yeah yeah and man well i guess dennis is still around and kicking and talking about uh I mean, he didn't seem like he was, um, I guess he didn't tell like an actual side of the story on the Zach Bagans show, but he was very um, emotional about it. It still really clearly fucks him up. He was. And remember something weird happened, uh, like something very jarring happened that scared the absolute shit out of us. Something I happened. Remember. I think he was like talking, like he still like talks to Natalie or something and like, like talks to like her ghost. And then like at the exact same time, something happened at the house. Yeah, something really weird happened. I remember you and I both jumped like out of our skin. Um, yeah. And I think like their call dropped or something. It was just very weird. Um, but again, like I'm going to rewatch it now that I kind of know more about the story and know who he is. Yeah, I want to um, too, especially because now I remember anytime we've gone to the museum too, we've seen the Natalie Wood room where like the wine bottle yes. and everything is at Zach's yes, museum. Yes, true. Yeah, so this sheds so much more. I wonder if Dennis donated like the whole fucking yacht to him or something. Well, it wasn't his, so I don't know. What happens? Been... What happens when a like does a boat when like a, a notorious person or like a famous person ends up like dying in a bombshell story? Like, does that boat still get used? I know this is such a random question, but I'm like, I feel like that should have been I mean, memorialized my guess would somewhere. Be that it's probably owned by robert wagner he probably sold it to somebody yeah, didn't want anything to highest do with bidder it. i don't know was and the highest then, bitter zachary alexander Bagans? i mean like genuinely maybe <laughs> like, how old was he like four when this happened no I um yeah i don't know i don't know it's a good question i have no clue hmm. well good story i mean good t telling of a bad story well thank you it's it's pretty dark but um but it does give us yeah. a reason to go watch that show again because i it don't sure think we does. ever even finished the four episodes i think those we didn't i think we got so scared that we never even finished it oh which we also one of the episodes we did watch though i think was about kevorkian if if i'm putting oh. in story requests Ooh, yeah yeah his fucking museum i don't know about it man i'm i know i like it but i know i'm scared at the same time i don't like it i think it makes me feel bad and weird <laughs> I appreciate that he's collecting things that other people don't know what to do with anymore. And he's like, I'll yeah. take it. And it's like a real mixed bag of all the weird shit that nobody else really wants. And he's like, I'll be the goodwill. Give it to me. You know? Sometimes I don't like that he does, like he puts on display, you know, paintings by uh, Charles Manson. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't love all that. I don't love the room of serial killers where he has like all their artwork. And I was going to say, what's the room that we went to on your bachelor party, which was such a fucking bummer. What, like not the one that I can't, the one that I felt physically ill, like just truly, I can't even really think about it. Cause it's it the mattress like skin crawl. Yeah. It's that yeah. room where there's a mattress in this, a, many men had been tortured on this mattress. Yeah. And, and it's I'm still like just, stained with like, it's still ugh. stained with like, all sorts of fluids I, and stuff and i yeah. thought that was n totally distasteful i was like i don't know I don't how that's not we well, it's should gone be now. staring at that so i think enough oh, people complained it. it's like that has Good. not the last like two or three I did times not i've gone it was find that there. to be it i was like that's too far sorry folks which like, i don't I'm know not. how that does not just get like burned or like left in like a like a uh like an evidence archives facility like that that was a lot i thought we were going it's and it was horrible. just gonna be like Bella Lugosi's mirror creepy dolls yeah creepy exactly dolls. and that part I think is great and fun and like spooky but the, the thing serial with the, killer like, stuff I cannot get behind deaths and like this like what let's all stare at it and 
it just feels like very distasteful to me well but... what was extra what was extra terrible that one that one room i remember being like i this was a bad oh, call. I, this was a i bad backed call out of come. there yeah um yeah but they also had not only are you looking at a mattress i mean like if there wasn't glass like it's it's still set on a cot so like if the like glass weren't in the way if the glass wasn't in between the two of you you could have just sat down on it like any other bed it was like uh. right fucking there and the thing that made it incredibly awful is that whoever was responsible for torturing people on that bed had audio recorded and they were playing the audio. They were playing the audio. It's like, what are you thinking? Yeah. That was like a beyond. Like I've never, like that was, that was so tone deaf and so not tasteful. So not, I was just really troubled by that. Yeah. Agreed. Agreed. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know what? All with a boulder of salt, as we say. Boulder Um, of salt. (laughs) Enjoy at your own risk, I suppose. Yeah. Although I will say that room is not there anymore. So I think enough people were oh. like, that is so beyond fucked up. Yeah, um, you did say that. Okay. Uh, no, the ghosts, the, all the, the things that he's inherited that were ghost things. I'm, I'm yes. like, I'm glad somebody's taking it in. And then That's I found fun. out from um, one of the employees there because I was like, oh, it seems like since last time I was here, like things have moved. Like, where right. are, th- where's this pile of dolls and where's this and this apparently this museum this is what i think they should do i'm not like the business guru like uh like zach is but apparently that house is only ever holding like a 60th of the shit that they own at one time oh wow so it's like a like exhibits are moving in and out of it like yeah apparently zach has like not only did he buy this museum he also bought an entire not like a storage like he bought the whole he bought facility. The whole facility. And oh like, my god! That's Shut what it sounds up. like. He's just got like, f- like ceiling to floor stacks and stacks and stacks of all haunted imagine, things. I mean, God forbid, but imagine that man dies tomorrow and someone has to go like through his estate. <laughs> I know. <laughs> like, Whoa! <laughs> it, you know who you'd make fucking do it, Aaron. <laughs> <laughs> by himself so right the the guy would read the lawyer would reach out be like hey you know you're on the list you're his executor and aaron would be like so touched and they'd be like now figure out what to do with all this shit by end of week yeah and also zach stopped paying the uh the electric bill so it's pitch black in that storage facility so get yeah um, get crawling (laughs) and he also uh he also maintained from beyond the grave that you must video record the entire thing and but also i honestly christine i guarantee in his will the final ghost adventures production would be zach oh, as a ghost for sure for it, sure it would no be doubt. go ghost hunting in zach's own home looking for like zach. he's planning and that, would that be already fade to black that is the final i guarantee it <laughs> the, i like mark my act. words when he when, I don't one day it. when he goes this will <laughs> exist i know it's already written down somewhere it's like um <laughs> It's like Dolly Parton, like how she has, did you hear about the song that she wrote? She no. has a song that she's already created and she's already said it's like no. her favorite song. And so she's so bummed out, like she'll never get to hear what people think of it, but it will, uh, it's only going to get released after she's died. Dude, I am not patient enough to be that way. And she's like, it's such a bummer. I won't hear people respond to it because it's my favorite Dude, song. <laughs> good for her for being so like restrained, but I don't know how people do that. Anyway. Wow. That will be the, like, there's going to be two series. One's going to be Aaron going through all of Zach's shit. And then the final episode will be looking for Zach. And that'll be it. <laughs> looking for Zach. <laughs> oh, God. It's so tragic, but so true. And we all know it. I know. Oh, my God. Anyway. Okay. All that to say, those, <laughs> the, the seven gates of hell and Natalie Wood, those are the reasons why we Boy. drink this week. Indeed. And Indeed. Uh, I'm, I'm very excited to, um, be getting so much uh time with you christine because i've been i saw you with my face and i'm seeing you with my screen and then like in a few days i'm gonna see you again with my face it's gonna be very fun i can't wait i can't wait and i can't wait that's why (laughs) we drink